أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم and welcome to another episode of the Aqsa Frontline Podcast I'm joined once again by Amr السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله How are you doing today? الحمد لله الحمد لله It's uh, our first episode since uh, Ramadan has ended It's a few weeks in the build-up and We've been uh, meaning to do a podcast on this topic for a, few, for a couple of weeks now um, since we had an incident that occurred on April the 1st We've been trying to find a time mm-hmm. And subhanAllah we only found a time to sit down and do this podcast today It's the 14th of April as we're recording And it's very timely isn't it? Yeah timely indeed um, We also wanted to do it yesterday um, But uh, things happened and we couldn't do it And um for that the 12, better, if anything, <laughs> twelve. Uh, yeah, that you know, twelve, twelve or so hours of difference has changed a lot in terms of what mm-hmm. we are about to speak about um, in regards to the topic of um, Iran. Yeah, controversial one today, um, and it's one that we want to give justice. So we thought we'd give a long, dedicated podcast to this topic to talk about Iran and to go into the topic of Iran's involvement in the Middle East, the involvement in Palestine their Quds brigades, their road to Al-Quds, their road to liberation of Palestine, Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas, all of these topics that we come across so many times and sometimes, you know, between us, we've dropped a few little comments in our last few, in our past few podcasts. Yeah. But if you don't go into the detail, it's hard to portray yeah. a proper image of Iran's position in this conflict. Yeah, look, it's, it's also a controversial topic. Mm-hmm. As you can imagine, it's very controversial um, to um, uh, Muslims at large and specifically the Shia Muslims. Um, and I think it's important for us to lay the ground, the, the, the ground for this topic, the layout of this topic. And um, there is a, a, the, the parameters of this topic and how we are, about to, we are about to delve into it. I think it's important for us to start off by saying that when we speak about Iran, um, we do not. We are not speaking about Shia. So there's a lot of people that correlate Iran with Shiism, and the moment you speak about Iran, it's as though you are speaking. At the moment you you criticize Iran, it's as though you are criticizing Shia. Um, and this is it's very important to differentiate here. And this is where we lay the groundwork for our topic. Like when we come out and criticize Turkey. Does that mean we are criticizing the Sunni Muslims? When we criticize Saudi, does that mean we are criticizing the Sunni Muslims? Um, and it, we have to be fair with ourselves, and our listeners have to be fair and open-minded um, in order for them to grasp what we are about to say in regards to the roles that are played by the likes of Turkey, of Saudi, of Iran. And it's important to differentiate where and how these states try to utilize certain sects or certain people within the Muslims in order for them to achieve their political objectives in the region. Like how we saw Saudi use the Sunni card for decades upon decades in order for them to try and achieve a leverage in the Muslim world and in order to serve the interests of America as well in the Muslim world. And a lot of people bought into this, that Saudi are the, are the Sunni stronghold, you know, um, Khadim al-Haramain, they have uh, the custodians of the two mosques. Um, and, and they played this role for a long time, up until recently, where they've done a complete ridda on this um, uh, notion. And they've come out openly and, ex- and they've pulled the masks off their faces because that role is no longer to be, to be served in the Middle East. And America does not need them to play that role anymore. They've served it well. Even though they've changed their attitude from the government down and the way that they portray themselves to the world, you still do see it amongst scholars or leaders or imams or mashayikh within Saudi in particular, mm. um, where they do use that card and they claim that attacks on Saudi or criticism of Saudi or of the government are an attack on Islam, they're an attack on Sunnah Islam, on Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, an attack on uh, Sharif al Haramain, or so on. So they do still use that card. And obviously, Iran as well, a lot of criticism against Iran. Um, obviously, we've sort of given away the fact from now that we're going to have a bit of criticism of Iran as we go through this, but we're going to go into a lot of detail. Um, but a lot, any criticism is immediately sort of brushed off as sectarian. You're being sectarian. You're anti-Shia. You're against Shia. Mm. Um, 
obvious response to that is our criticism extends to all the Muslim governments. It's not exclusive to Iran. Um, but then what they'll say is sort of like, you know, you're, you're, you're failing to see any of the good that they do just because that they, just because this year. Yeah. But the, uh, when we've come to criticizing Iran, before we've criticized Iran, we've already criticized Saudi, Jordan, Turkey, every single Arab or so-called Sunni nation. And by the time we've reached Iran, all these nations have already been exposed to the people. And it's important to, to differentiate where, you know, we said, you said that there's still some Saudi scholars that still say that Saudi is, is a Sunni, you have to mm. respect it, et cetera, et cetera. But the main, main important point is that the people don't buy into this anymore. Before, there were people that used to buy into it. True. And the awareness of the people is what matters here, not what the governments say. The awareness of the, of the uh, Muslim Sunni populations today is, you know, it's much, much bigger than what it was um, a decade ago. Mm. So now everyone is talking about how the Arab regimes are all, are all treacherous regimes, regardless of what they say in regards to that they want to stand up for Palestine or for Jerusalem. Yep. All of them agree that Turkey, okay, right now is a treacherous regime, or the majority of them. There are yep. still some uh, pockets here and there that still say, oh, give him more time, Erdogan is... is is shackled, he can't do this and that, mm. he has to play politics. Um, but the, when we talk about the majority of the people and their awareness, this is where it's important. Taib, this is our f fifth episode of the podcast. Yeah. We haven't done an episode dedicated to Turkey. We haven't done an episode dedicated to Egypt. We haven't done an episode dedicated needed. to Saudi. But, but we're doing one dedicated to Iran. Because it's not needed, because they are, these, these regimes are already exposed. Yep. We don't need, they've exposed themselves. They've done the job. Um, whereas Iran is still portrays itself as the, um, still marching on the path of the liberation of Al-Quds up until today, they use this line. Yep. So we need to unpack this. Are they really, do they really want to liberate Palestine? Are they really upon the path of liberating J Jerusalem? Um, their expansion in the region, is it really for the sake of liberating Palestine? So we need to unpack all this to really understand what their motives are, why they are in the region, and what their intentions are, and how far it, it can go. Um, and this is why it's important for us to unpack anyone that says we um, stand for Palestine and we want to liberate Palestine. We need to look at them and ask a serious question. What are your motives and what are you doing in the region? Taib, let's crack into it. And let's talk about what's been happening recently. Um, for those who are listening, this is inshallah, we're planning to have a longer episode to go into detail in a bit of the history, a bit of the context, some broad geopolitical concepts and principles for us to understand the region, the Middle East, America's involvement, before talking more specifically about Iran, about Iran's history and the involvement in different conflicts, and then talking, of course, about Palestine specifically, and then coming back to recent events and going into more detail. Mm. So as I said today, for us, April 14th, we're recording here in the morning um, here in Sydney, and as we talk, it's been breaking news for the past few hours. Um, this is all in the context of what happened two weeks ago. On April the 1st, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, in Syria, was bombed and attacked by Zionist forces. Um, they sent out a, a one of their planes and they performed a strike on the um, Iranian consulate in Damascus. Mm. And in doing so, of course, the consulate and the embassy are considered to be a uh, sovereign Iranian territory. So they've in breach the, not just Syrian territory, but now Iranian territory as well. And very significantly, they uh, killed a number of Iranian officials, most significantly Mohammad Reza Zahidi, uh, one of the top commanders in the in Iran's uh, revolutionary uh, revolution guard corps, um, the IRGC. He's the second highest command um, in the IRGC. Was assassinated in this attempt, as well as a number of other senior commanders, and six Syrian citizens were killed as well. This happened on April the first, and since then, there have been rumors and. Uh, sort of whispers and hype. threats and hype of escalation for the past two weeks. Uh, Zionists initially came out and said, we don't know who did this before they eventually claimed responsibility. America came out and said, you know, we stand firmly against any Iranian response and we will stand and defend um, our partners, the Zionists. Um, uh, from, you know, Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah gave a speech a few days ago where he said that the whole world, including America and Israel, knows that Iran will respond and that retaliation is Iran's inherent response. Uh, on the day of Eid, Ayatollah Khamenei came out and gave a powerful speech to his people. He said that Israel must be punished. So they've been preparing for this response 
and the Zionists as well, on the other hand, have been expecting a response. So they've been preparing themselves. Um, they've been sort of preparing their resources. They've been preparing their armies. They've been calling their backup uh, medical personnel. Um, I think Netanyahu cancelled some sort of trip that he had planned. Uh, they've prepared their air forces and their air defences and their Iron Dome. They've called off their schools. Um, as of last night, they announced that there should be no public gatherings of more than a thousand people. They've closed many of their embassies around the region in fear that Iran would retaliate in like doing the same sort of attack, attack a Zionist embassy in the region. So they've called their ambassadors back and called their embassies. So clearly they're expecting some sort of response. That's what we've been seeing for two weeks. And the question in everybody's mind was, is Iran going to respond and how are they going to respond? Yeah. We finally saw the response overnight. Um, so yesterday, Iran came in and they seized, first of all, a ship um, in the in the sort of sea near them. And uh, that ship was a Portuguese ship owned by an Israeli businessman. But it didn't clearly seem to be the response because it wasn't that significant of a response until finally we saw as of now, it's probably about five or six hours ago, where Iran formally responded. They sent some of their unarmed vehicles, their drones from Tehran all the way um, towards the occupied Palestinian territories, um, as well as a number of missiles. They've sent, as of now, close to 200 missiles, um, from not just from Iran, but from Iraqi bases, from Yemeni bases, from Lebanese bases or Hezbollah bases in the south of Lebanon. And those strikes have been sort of flowing over into occupied territories. There have been some strikes. Um, there's reports that they've struck a military air base in the Naqab region, the occupied Naqab or Negev region, um, and caused some damage there. We haven't yet heard any reports of any injuries or of any damages or any casualties. Um, we do know of some damages, which the Zionists claim are minor to this military air base in the Negev, but nothing else more than that. Mm. The Zionists have had their defense set up. They've been intercepting some of these drones and missiles outside of their territories, so in Syria and um, in Jordan and Lebanon and areas like this, as well as having their Iron Dome set up, which has been doing its part. Yeah. What do you make of what's been happening so far? I mean, I guess any nation, any sovereign nation, any nation that claims to have power and ability to defend itself, and any nation that's attacked the same way that Iran was attacked on the 1st of April in their consulate, in Damascus would have to have some sort of response to the um, attacking nation, other the, the enemy nation. They have to respond. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how. And I think their response was coming, everyone knew it was coming, American knew it was coming, everyone knew it was coming. It's just a matter of when and how it was going to happen. But they had to respond. If they didn't respond, that would make them look very weak in front of the whole world, in front of the Zionist entity, in front of their supporters, yep. and in front of their proxies. You can't just stand idly by and your senior military commanders were just assassinated inside the, the Iranian consulate in Damascus and, and just use strategic patience, which is what they've been using since 7th of October, saying we haven't when, they, when, when asked why haven't you escalated attacks against a Zionist entity as Iran, not as proxies, they would say we are using strategic patience. That was the excuse so far. Long before 7 October as well. Long before. That, that, uh, let's, I'm just going to keep yeah. it within the range. Um, so strategic patience has been the line that they've been using, been using for the past uh, few months. Um, so if we look at over 30,000 Palestinians that have been um, uh, martyred inside Gaza for the past seven months of genocide. That wasn't enough for Iran to move its uh, drones. It wasn't enough for Iran to move its ballistic missiles for the sake of the people of Palestine, for the sake of liberating Palestine, for the sake of on the path of Al-Quds. But it was enough that seven of its military commanders were assassinated for it to come out and respond directly to the Zionist entity. So this proves one thing, that they are willing to move for their national interests in the region mm -hmm. and not for the interests of the Muslims at large or the interests of Palestine. This is enough indication for us to make this claim. Um, and if, and because they know, you know, I Iran has, I think it was 2018 or 2017, 
the Iranians came out and said, we can destroy Israel in seven minutes. Mm. Second of March, 2017. 2017, second yep. of March. The IRDC announced it. In seven minutes, they can destroy Israel. Yep. I'm not doubting that they have the capability to destroy Israel. They might have the capability to destroy it. But will they actually put that capability to use for the sake of liberating Palestine? That's where we come in and we try and analyze. Mm -hmm. Do they really want to liberate Palestine? And is there movements in the region for the sake of Palestine? Or is it for the sake of their nationalist agenda in the region and they're using Palestine or Palestine as a token in order to win the support of the Muslims in the region? in order for the Muslims to open up their arms for them, in order for the Muslims to justify their expansion in the region. This is where we have to really analyze what's happening here. And today's events are events that have been exposing every single regime, every single country around the world, Western countries, Eastern countries. Everyone's been exposed because mm. it's testing everyone. It's testing their true intentions. It's testing, do they really care about Palestine? And especially those who have been saying, we stand with the people of Palestine, we will always stand by them. Today, this is a test for you. Will you stand by the people of Palestine when they really need you? Will you really stand with them the way that you should stand with them? Not just tokenistic sl slogans. Will you liberate Palestine since you have the capability to liberate Palestine from this evil occupying terrorist entity? Mm -hmm. And this is where we need to look at how Iran has been moving in the region since um, the Iranian revolution, because that's the turning point in Iranian policies in the yeah. region. So and go from there. Yeah, so let's take a step back because I think for us to answer these questions that you're asking, and specifically about Iran, well obviously we need to look at a bit of Iran's history, their policies, their strategy, their interests, and so on. And I think before we can even talk about Iran, we have to just talk about the Middle East in general and politics in general, I guess. Um, I think. We like a, a lot of people obviously know the history of colonialism and where the West and Europe entered our lands in Africa and Asia and the Middle East and they colonized many of these countries. Whether it was direct colonization, occupation, took the resources for themselves, um, whether they killed people on the ground, whatever they did, there were many different forms of their colonialism. And this changed as we went from sort of the 19th to the 20th century where they chose to pull out their forces from direct colonization, occupation of these nations in majority of cases. And what we saw from the British and French in particular was that they imposed their um, control over these lands, not by directly being there on the ground, but by installing rulers and puppets on the ground who were loyal to these nations, right? So we saw this in so many different examples, right? So wherever you look... Um, there were cases where leaders were appointed over different nations and you can count examples all day long um, and you'll see that people who were there were actually not sort of really interested in their nation's interests but rather they just continued serving the interests of again most particularly Britain and France in these countries um, one example clear one that most people sort of be familiar with is uh, Mustafa Kemal or Kemal Ataturk uh, in Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Khilafah was appointed as the leader of the Turkish Republic and essentially what he did was completely remove Islam from Turkey, was completely remove any of these sentiments and try to transform Turkey into a secular Western state, which served essentially the agenda that Britain had in that region. Um, Britain and France were the main sort of colonizers throughout most of our lands throughout the 20th century and then World War II happened and World War II weakened Europe significantly. Um, Hitler and the Nazis and what they did and the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente and the cl clashes that they had and America came in late in World War II and helped provide the victory to the uh, to, to 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 the Allies um, during World War Two. Now they were victorious, but Britain and France were significantly weakened after World War Two. And America, who had previously been very much isolationist, found an opportunity now to expand their power and their control over the rest of the world. So we see, for example, the Zionist project um, and the occupation of Palestine was initially put in by the British. Right? They came in, they imposed the British mandate, and then they handed the nation over to the Zionists. Um, after World War II, though, we see that the control and the favor and who sort of dominated the Zionist project wasn't the British, it was now the Americans. Americans bought the support of the Zionist lobby and they provided their military aid and their funding and so on to the Zionist entity. And as a result, they are now the ones who very much control and are the main supplier and supporter for the Zionist entity. We saw America do this in many other places, like an example is Iran. 
um, when the Shah was removed from Iran, uh, and after that, the sort of that that was a change in rulership over over Iran mm. from uh, British rule to now America having their fingers within Iran or America having the control over Iran. Of course, this is before um, Khomeini's Islamic Revolution. Mm. So they did this in a number of different nations. We see it in many of our countries where the favors were now being given to America rather than to the British. Mm. And it's important to recognize like just how significantly they controlled our countries. Like this isn't something that's like a conspiracy or whatever. This is all well documented. It's well backed. We see it from a rulership perspective or the leadership of these countries. There's a lot of declassified CIA documents about a lot of nations in South Africa, uh, South America and Africa and the Middle East and so on, which talk about this sort of thing. Um, but not just in terms of leadership. It's also about the policies within the nation. It's about the borders and sort of the, how these countries extended their control beyond their borders. Um, it's about, for example, the education system within these nations and the ideas that were being passed throughout Um throughout the education systems and the universities and the academics, the entertainment systems, all of these things were being pushed to preference and to push forward Western ideas and American ideals and American agendas within these nations, right? So this is American imperialism and neocolonialism at its finest dominated over the region. We need to understand before we could talk about any nation and their involvement in these political issues, just how significantly America is involved in every single country and its policies and how they often play both sides of clashes as well, right? So you'll see a clash between two countries, or two nations, or two tribes, or two groups, or whatever it is, and America is there supporting people on both sides, right? And the reason that they do that is because they want to win over both sides, so no matter who is victorious, they still have their influence. Um, or also they that they can- Keep a balance of power as well. Keep a balance of power to derail people sometimes, yeah. play the carrot and the stick, play good cop, bad cop, so they sort of influence at every level. Yeah, I would say there's no country in the Middle East in particular, and you could sort of speak more broadly about that. Recently, we have China and Russia emerging with a bit more power than they previously had. But generally speaking, there's no country in particular in the Middle East that operates with any true independence and sovereignty. Yeah, they, that's right. There are some who are complete puppets. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you look at the Saudi rulers today, right? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps they have some of their own interests, but essentially they don't do anything, especially on a foreign policy level, except that it's dictated by America. Mm -hmm. We see this in, for example, Jordan. We see this with Sisi in Egypt. They don't even serve the interests of Egypt or Jordan. They just serve the interests of whatever America is sending them to do, mm. right? There are some others that might not be complete subordinate puppet states. Right? So Turkey, for example, would you say they're complete puppets and Erdogan is a complete set that's just serving American interests or? Uh, yeah, Turkey is, a, is a, what would say is a satellite state mm -hmm. that works in the region in order to serve its own interests and serving America's interests at the same time. But ultimately the greater interest for America where America would, would use, utilize Turkey for certain um, missions in the region or certain um, goals in the region. And then it will give it a piece of the piece of the pie or piece of the cake at the end of, the, or during that mission. For example, in, in, Iraq, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Azerbaijan, in Libya. These are very mm. recent conflicts where Turkey has had an active role in there. And definitely Turkey is not moving on its own accord in these regions. Because even though they might prefer obviously to serve their own interests, yeah. They don't have the ability to do that because they don't have the strength, they don't have the power, the economic might, the military might, the political and... I mean, they have, whatever. Turkey has military might. It's, it's I think, the, the second or the first strongest military army in, in the region. In but region. strong enough to go against America's interests? Um, if, if we want to, uh, obviously, if, if you speak to a military um, expert, we'll say to you, no, the powers don't align. Mm. Um, but when you say strong enough, as in does it have the will, does it have the capacity and capability to withhold or, or stand against America? Um, and does it have the, the, the population that's willing to stand and, and buy the government? Mm. Then if we look at recent examples like Afghanistan, then yes. Yeah, fair enough. You know, but <clears throat> the way they look at it is in order for us to reach this pinnacle of strength where we can actually say no to America, okay, this is the line of thinking of um, pragmatism and Erdogan, etc. In order for us to reach that level of strength, we need to build our military capabilities slowly, slowly by serving the interests of America, whilst within also the serving our own interests here and there, in order to unlock our capabilities of building our own um, drones, building our own fighter jets, building our own weapons, and that way we don't have to rely on the West to give us to sell us weapons. 
when we reach this stage where we are fully self-reliant, okay, and we have that power where we can finally say no to America, okay, this is where we're going to say no to America. That's that's the line of thinking. Mm. But the question is, do you really think America is going to allow you to do that under its nose? Mm. Or is it going to cause chaos in your country by supporting opponents like Fatullah Gulen, for example, and cause chaos inside the country and uprisings and whatnot, like we said earlier, that the America is willing to support yep. both sides in a country to, to balance out the power in order to put the country into ruins and weaken the economy and weaken the country. Mm. Like we saw in the failed attempt uh, attempted coup in Turkey in 2016, um, if if my memory is correct, it's 2016, failed attempted coup in, in in that year, where America, the first thing that America said whilst the coup was ongoing, they said we are watching closely what's happening in Turkey. They didn't say anything in regards to which side they are with. Are they against the coup? Are they with the coup? What? Not? They said we are watching closely. They are waiting for the results of the coup. The stronger side that comes out, America will come out straight away and support mm. it. I think it was Reagan, if I'm not mistaken, Reagan, who said, um, America has no allies or enemies. We just have interests. That's right. The exact thing where they'll sort of partner with both sides and they wait to see who comes out on top and they'll um, take advantage of that situation in the way that benefits them the most. Yeah, so... So Turkey, for example, operates within that satellite of America where they're orbiting around America. Yeah. And they might have some of their own interests and they might have some goals and ambitions for themselves. Yeah. But overall, their actions in the region are very much controlled by what America permits them or restricts them from doing. Yeah, definitely. And, and the moment they step over that red line of where America permits them or not, they'll release their YPG um, for Kurdish forces mm. against Turkish forces or inside the Turkish country in order to, put, in order to use a stick against Turkey. Yep. So you've gone too far in Syria. You've gone too far in Iraq, you know, take a few step backs, otherwise we're going to release, let loose the Kurdish um, uh, forces against you inside your own country and cause havoc and cause chaos inside the country, and Turkey, which no country wants. Yeah, and Turkey, for example, even like have sort of had these restrictions placed on them because the Emirates as well has sort of come into the region and sort of allied with different partners along sort of the Eastern Mediterranean and the yes. gas pipelines over there. You have Egypt, who's within that region, again, sort of it has similar clashing interests and Egypt as well and Sisi putting more pressure on on, on Erdogan um, so for example recently we saw Erdogan essentially sell out the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood who had fled from Egypt yeah. um, and come to Turkey and then recently because of the immense pressure that was being put on by the Emirates and by Egypt Erdogan essentially said we can't we can no longer provide safety for these leaders of the Brotherhood so they've had to go and seek um, protection elsewhere so that's Afghanistan it. I think uh, yeah. I spoke to Taliban in Afghanistan so that's Turkey. Yeah. Iran, similar? So Iran is very similar to Turkey in this instance, where Iran is it, it operates within the orbit of America in the region. But the difference between Iran and, and Turkey is there's a, there's a stark difference. Stark difference in the speech. Iran has been saying that America is a great Satan for, since, it's, uh, since the Iranian revolution. Mm -hmm. They've had a strong turn against America. Very strong turn. As though they are... Um, uh, you know, number one enemies to each other. Whereas Turkey, it avoids that speech altogether. It avoids the speech of uh, threats. It avoids the speech of uh, um, in inflicting uh, uh, harm or uh, inflicting harm against America. Whereas Iran, it's been um, uh, turning or, or repeating these slogans since the Iranian Revolution. Do you think Iran? and its leaders and its leadership genuinely have this feeling in their hearts that America is the greatest shaitan and that they're our biggest enemy? I'm not sure when it, when it comes to them personally as leaders, mm. but I don't doubt that anyone doubts that America is the great Satan of the world <laughs> with, the, with the terror that they inflict in many nations and, and the terror that they support, especially the, the Zionist entity. Um, but speech is one thing and then actions is another. Mm. So this is where we have to look at their speech and then look at their actions. Do they line up? Um, and this is where Iran, I think Iran messed up with its speech because its speech is like high level threats mm. and high level enmity, uh, enmity towards America. Whereas its actions, okay, don't line up. 
and this is where they've exposed themselves to criticism, say, you've been talking against America the Great Satan for so many years, and whilst American bases are inside Iraq, America inv invades Iraq on your doorstep, and what happens is America hands you over Iraq on a silver platter for you to take over the country and rule the country. Mm. How do you how do you explain that? You've been saying you're against America, but America invades Afghanistan again, your neighboring country, and you provide airspace air for American forces to enter into Afghanistan, and you, and you provide uh, you know some sort of support for that invasion of Afghanistan. Mm. How do you how do you explain that? So there's there's other scenarios which yep. we'll go in deeper into. Yeah. So 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 we're saying that Iran would have their own interest in the region, yeah. right? But we've talked about how this sort of worked with America um, in the past, and we'll go into more detail on those and sort of other sort of examples as well. But obviously America is also very critical and very strong in its speech against Iran as well, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that this is this is where it's interesting to note like America's strategies and that they use these sort of strategies elsewhere as well. Like everybody says, for example, with ISIS, how America spoke about ISIS as the biggest threat to the world and terror group and this and that. But I think the majority of people, if not everybody, sees through that now and recognizes how America used ISIS for its own benefit in the region. Yeah. Whether it was through popping them up, however far you want to believe, whether ISIS is a complete creation of America, whether they were just supported, whether they were propped up, whether they were just used and America took advantage of their terror. Whatever you want to believe, America clearly spoke very harshly about them and but still used them for their own benefit in the region. Um, in particular, sort of going and further destabilize Iraq and Syria and to destabilize the Syrian revolution. Um, Iran, I would say similar. That America does speak very harshly of them, particularly the Republicans. The Democrats, I think, are a bit more mm. uh, favorable with their speech. They talk more about sort of making deals and agreements mm. and bringing Iran back into the fold of the world. Obama and Biden have worked very strongly on like nuclear deals, whereas the Republicans speak more harshly towards Iran, yeah. whether that's to gain the support of their base, so the far-right Christians, or whether it's the Zionists. Um, they speak more harshly. Yeah. But at the same time, we say that despite that, Republicans and Democrats have both worked well with Iran throughout history. Yeah. Um, and like you said, it comes down to action rather than just speech. So I think it's interesting, like once we look at the details of how they've worked together, is when we'll see, we'll sort of, sort of further understand this relationship between them, right? Mm. Um, so to be honest, it dates back all the way to Khomeini. Mm. And Khomeini came in as this you know, Islamic revolution and he's going to overthrow the rulership of uh of uh, of the sure. of the Shah, um, and you know, we'll f then uh, you know, take over, establish the Islamic Republic of Iran, mm. the Shia Republic, and implementing the Sharia, and implementing Islamic law, and this idea spread like wildfire fire throughout Iran, and not just Iran, but also Muslim spread world. throughout the Muslim world. Muslim world supporting, yeah, supporting and, and it was seen as the first really Islamic revolution mm. in in the modern day, and people were supportive of this, and it gave them a lot of hope, yeah. right? And like you said, this very, very strong, powerful speech of America is the greater devil and speaking against the Zionist occupation, America against American involvement in our lands and talking about how America is uh, supportive of the Shah and how they overthrew the previous Iranian rulership um, to sort of get rid of Brit British power to then impose American power over Iran and Iran is not independent and we need to bring in Iranian power, especially in the context of as well at the time, Saudi had started demonstrating their favor or their, their sort of favor towards the US and their slow gradual shift away from Islamic sentiments if you want to call it that but despite all of that mm. Khomeini himself was in contact with America before the revolution mm. when he was in Paris when he was in France um, obviously in exile from Iran at the time and there's been declassified documents from the CIA and from American um, diplomatic cables who have shown that Khomeini for example was in contact with the Qatar administration weeks ahead of the Islamic revolution that he communicated with them strongly to sort of make sure that they would not jeopardize his plans to return to Iran and that they would not jeopardize the Iranian revolution. Um, the fact that his uh, different political and religious figures who were around him, who were also in contact um, with US officials, such as uh, his longtime friend and associate, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Sadiq Lavasani, who met with the embassy, US embassy officials at uh, Tehran. And so there was this contact happening between them. Yeah. Now, again, whether you want to go to the extent to say that the entire uh, Islamic revolution was set up by America, probably too far, 
whether you want to say that America took advantage of this situation, wherever you want to draw the line, the point here to make is that Khomeini, despite all of his speech, recognized that political change cannot happen in this region except that America has their hands within it. And that I can't achieve the change or the power that I want to achieve mm. without making sure that I'm in contact with America and that America is on my side and that America is not going to jeopardize my actions. Yeah. Because the moment that America sees what's happening and if they were antagonistic towards him and said, no, we're not going to allow this to happen, yeah. it would have been very easy for them to thwart his revolution. Yeah. Or limit the revolution as well. You can have a revolution. You yeah. Can just limit its its effect in the region mm -hmm. and just confine it to Iran and just keep it isolated from the world. But Khomeini recognized, communicate with them. Yeah. Right? Because they, overall, end of the day, they have the power in the region. Yeah. And even after he gained power, um, even after the revolution, Iranian revolutions were meeting, including Khomeini's second in command, including his uh, foreign minister, including the first prime minister after the revolution, Mahdi Bazargan, mm -hmm. meeting with US representatives almost immediately. And then there was like the, in between 1981 and 1986, there was the, the senior administrator, administration officials in the US, they secretly facilitated the illegal sale, okay, of arms to Iran, mm -hmm. which were subject to an arms embargo at the time. So this is, and this was a, a, a big shipment of arms to Iran, which pissed off the Zionists at the time. Yeah. How could the America do that? So you can see, like you said, there's, although there was that, um, the big speech against America in the background and under the table, there was talks, there was meetings, and then there was secret arms sales that were going to Iran in order what? To prepare it for its role in the region, which it was about to play. On that topic of the arms sales, so back then, um, it's actually really interesting when you look at sort of the politics underlying this as well in the US, especially as you talk about like in America right now is um, at a very sort of tumultuous times before the elections coming up. Um, back then it was Reagan and Carter. Reagan, Republican, Carter, Democrats. And there was a very, very high chance that Carter would be re-elected back into office. So Reagan was in power and Iran had American hostages. Mm, yes. Reagan said, hold on to those hostages, delay their release, and we'll give you arms. Mm. To extend this, effort, this, this clash between America and Iran, this, because obviously when there's war and when there's clash, people are more sort of internally, uh, they have more fear, yeah. and they're more likely to sort of go with people who are more strong in the outside, like Reagan, who Patri was- Patriotic. Patriotic, Reagan, and the Republicans who are yeah. more sort of strong in their speech and strong yeah. against Iran, more likely to get reelected. Beat up the drums of war to win the elections. Right, yeah. and so Reagan, did this arms deal, secret arms deal with Iran with the hopes that they would hold on to or with the instructions to hold on to the American hostages for a longer period of time mm. so that he could avoid Carter getting re-elected ahead of him. And so even though they lied in public, and again, this is like sort of documents that have been sort of released and declassified over time, which show the way that America works and the way that they're very, very mm. um, tricky and under the table with their deals that they do. But obviously the main point here is Iran operating within the sphere and within the satellite of America. Mm. Right, yeah. we see this throughout history. Um, they allowed, like we said, uh, America to use airspace. So even before the Iraq invasion, yeah. um, during the Gulf War, America was using airspace from Iran uh, to fight against Saddam Hussein back in '91. Right, yeah. and this is under George Bush, right? Okay. And Bush, obviously, again Republican, very strong in speech against Iran, but liaising with Iran to use the airspace to fight against a common enemy at the time, Saddam Hussein. So they're liaising with them throughout. Maybe they have their own interests, their interests and America's interests don't align at yeah. times, yeah. but they recognize we have to work within the satellite of America in order for us to maintain our control over the region, for us to get some of the crumbs of America's mm. political games in this region, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Iraq, America comes in, tries to topple Saddam Hussein, and this is where we see one of the clear examples of Iran and America working together. Yeah, it's, it's clear, and it's clear as daylight. I mean, no one can deny it. And up until today, the American forces are still there, American bases are still there, the Amer American green zone is still there. And then you have also, at the same time, in the same country, a Iraqi government that's propped up by Iran and supported by Iran, and and uh, there's strong Iranian representation inside Iraq. It's controlled by Iran. Everyone knows that. There's no denial about that. There's uh, Iraqi militias that are controlled by Iran and they are proxies of Iran. And stronger than the Iraqi army perhaps. Stronger than the Iraqi army mm -hmm. and they are prevented from attacking American bases. Yes, they do some attacks here and there, but very limited. And when they go and cross the red lines, they are pulled back by Iran. Mm -hmm. America tells Iran, pull them back. 
they've gone too far and they pull them back. Yep. If they don't pull them back, then there are some repercussions against those militias specifically. Syria. You so know? Just on Iraq, before we get to Syria, yeah. um, some interesting quotes, just to sort of demonstrate like the extent of this. Um, this is a quote from Iranian President Ahmadinejad back in 2008. He said, Our country has also provided assistance to America in the restoration of calmness and stability in Iraq. Okay, Obama in 2015 says that the single greatest beneficiary of the US-Iraq invasion was the Islamic Republic of Iran. The New York Times reports after the Iraq invasion that Iran dominates in Iraq after the US handed the country over. Muhammad Ali Abdahi, who is uh, one of the uh, senior members, I think the uh, uh, st- uh, st- uh, Secretary of Staff mm. um, for the Iranian government at the time, says that Iran would help the US in Iraq and Afghanistan, ensuring that Kabul and Baghdad would fall quickly. Yeah. The way that a lot of supporters of Iran justify this is that they say Saddam was an oppressor, Saddam was a tyrant, Saddam was a dictator, and it was in everyone's interest in the region to topple Saddam. Yeah. So therefore, we worked with America to get rid of him. Mm. Is that justified? Well, definitely not. I mean, we all agree that Saddam was a dictator. We all, even us as Sunni Muslims, mm-hmm. we agree that he was a dictator, he was oppressive, he was a tyrant, mm. like Bashar al-Assad, like Sisi, like the Arab rulers, same thing. But does that justify opening up the country to foreign invasion and giving them the land and, gi- and giving them the access to the resources? No. Mm. By no means does it allow, does it open up for that. Especially look at the amount of gold and oil that were usurped from Iraq for American benefit. And obviously the fact that the biggest loser in all of this was not Muslims. Saddam and his people, it was the people on the ground. Over a million, it was the civilians. Yeah, the civilians, the Muslim civilians. The chemical weapons that were used, um, and and up until today, Iraq Iraq is paying the price. The people are paying the price for that war. Mm. So no, nothing justifies working with foreign invasion in order to fight against a tyrant. It's like uh, at the time of the Sahaba anhum, when they were having infighting between each other, um, uh, was uh, between uh, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu and um, uh, Muawiyah and uh, one of the Romans sent a, a message to Muawiyah saying we can send you support or was it Ali one of them we can, send, we, to Muawiyah, we can send you support to fight against Ali and he responded that if you try and get involved in our internal affairs me and uh, Ali will unite and come fight you mm-hmm. you know something along those lines so our history tells us that we don't use foreign foreign enemy to open up our lands, to come into our lands and take everything in order for us to fight against an opp- oppressor mm-hmm. in our times. And Afghanistan is the same. Same um, thing as Afghanistan, yes. Ahmadinejad again said, we helped America in Afghanistan. Uh, Rafsanjani, the former Iranian president, said in 2002 that if it were not for our troops fighting the Taliban, America would have sunk in the Afghan quagmire. There was a RAND report in 2014 titled Iran's Influence in Afghanistan. And they said that even if US and Iran tensions remain, Iran's activities in Afghanistan are unlikely to run counter to the overall US objectives. Mm. They had the same goals. They wanted to infiltrate within this region to prevent the rise of uh, Islamist sentiments, if you want to call it that. Mm. Um, Iran had their goals, America had their goals on what they wanted to achieve within there, but essentially they worked hand in hand. That's right. Iran provided the airspace, Iran provided the means for America to enter into Afghanistan and we can see what's happened to Afghanistan over the past 20, 25 years, the amount of destruction that's been suffered, the amount of suffering that the people have faced, whatever you want to think of the Taliban. If you want to say Iran is justified attacking the Taliban, even if you want to go to that extent, you can't justify them allowing the US to come in and do what they did mm-hmm. and cause the extent of damage that they did within this region where the people essentially are the ones that suffered. Yeah, And so this is part of the history. Um, and part of sort of what they've done, right? So we see this in Afghanistan, we see this in Iraq, um, and then we see obviously historically the other involvement with America. And again, the point here that we're making is that Iran cannot operate in the region except that they're collaborating and liaising with America because America dominates over the region. Yeah. And so they're operating within the satellite. That's fine, do that. But don't come out and, and uh, deceive your people mm. and deceive your supporters that you are anti-America, that America is a great Satan, yep. that you are out to fight America. Don't deceive the people. That's right. Work with America. Say, yeah, we work with America openly. And don't deceive the people with these Islamic sentiments mm-hmm. that we are here to establish this 
um, Islamic uh, um, Republic. Republic and we are expanding our borders for, for the sake of Islam and, and use the, the Shia people in order to serve your agenda in the region. And Because even if you want to call Saddam mm. evil, to whatever extent, they say America is a shaitan akbar, the greatest shaitan. Yeah. So how can you ally with the greatest of evils against, small against another evil, right? <laughs> against how can you ally with the shaitan like but against the Taliban if that's who you think your enemy is? That's right. Like you're justifying working with the greatest of enemies. It's not the enemy of my enemy. Yeah. This is literally, this is your, like why not work with the Taliban against America? Yeah. Why not work with Saddam against America? If that's the way that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, yeah. why not ally against the greater evil in the region? Mm. But they're allying with America because that's what serves their interests in the region. That's because America said, help us here, we'll scratch my back, we'll scratch your yeah. back. And then we see, for example, in Iraq, how they've, dominated over Iraq ever since the Iraq war. As we said, Obama is the one who said that Iran is the biggest victor coming out of the Iraq war mm. because we say that they've now got control over that region. Um, the l rulership and leadership in Iraq since the, since the American invasion has been favorable towards Iran ever since. They've got the militias running through. They've got resources coming towards them. They've got the ability to use Iraqi airspace and Iraqi military bases for their own benefit. And this opened up a lot of possibilities for it to expand further into, region, into the region. Yep. And we saw this come into play with the Syrian revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because um, ISIS um, and other groups that went from Iraq to Syria were um, annihilated as soon as America wanted to annihilate, annihilate them. Yep. That's it, America said they allowed them to expand serve their interest in Syria in order to thwart the revolution. They used ISIS for that. Um, they done takfir on most of, uh, most of the people that ISIS fought were Sunni rebel groups mm. rather than anyone else, rather than Bashar. And they thwarted the revolution. And then America got rid of ISIS to some extent. Uh, they will use them every now and then um, with their infiltrations attack here and in there. Russia or yeah, attacking <laughs> Russia, attacking Iran and all that, you know, it's, uh, every, uh, no one buys into it. Whereas Iran, and the, the, its proxies were, were allowed to expand from Iraq into Syria under the eyes of the world. Mm. Okay. Um, Sorry, can we take a step back just in case sort of anyone's not familiar? Yeah. Just about Syrian revolution in general. So what's Bashar's history? Why did the people rise up? Because the propaganda that you hear in response or the response that you hear is essentially that this was an American-backed revolution against Bashar, and Bashar is the only Arab leader who stood up against Israel, and um, you know, American-backed revolution to try to take him down. The Zionists were propping up the revolution. Um, ISIS was the biggest factor in the revolution. Can we get a bit of background? Like, yeah, what yeah. was the story with the Syrian revolution? I don't want to go too deep into it because it's the Syrian revolution. Just briefly, is, briefly, it needs maybe ten hours on its own. But it's funny because <clears throat> you would think that. Um, Muslims with their various differences of opinions, etc., would stand with each other against a, a, a common enemy or, co or, or common dictator. I say this because it was, the, it was actually the Shia that first came out and made takfir on the Alawis. They said the Alawis are kuffar. Okay? So they actually don't see them as an extension of them. Yep. But they see them as this ally in in al um, al muqawama wal mumana'a in in the resistance axis of resistance yeah okay it's political interest it's political interest yeah. purely political and purely national interest in the region it's got nothing to do with creedal or islamic etc um i don't want to go into too much depth into the syrian revolution about like how they said it was an Amer american um, threat against Bashar al-Assad, American um, attempts to bring him down, etc. Et as, as, as though Bashar al-Assad can stand up to America and um, withstand any attempts for America to bring him down. Mm. Um, what we saw, what we see today, okay, is that American forces are inside Syria and, and they've established bases inside Syria and so have the, um, the Iranian militias and so have the Iraqi militias and so has Bashar, Bashar, Bashar al-Assad's uh, militias as well, okay? And so has some uh, factions from uh, Tahrir al-Sham, etc. in Idlib. So what they've done is they've split up Syria. They've um, done mass um, evacuate, mass, uh, uh, deport, what do you call it? Evacuations, deportations. Yeah, an evacuation of people from um, specific areas to another area. They've changed the demographics in Syria. All right, to serve certain agendas where the biggest piece of the cake 
was given to Iranians and Bashar al-Assad yep. under the eyes of America, under the coordination of America and other countries that also helped play a big part in this, including Turkey and including uh, Qatar, including Saudi, including the, uh, the, um, the UAE. Mm-hmm. So all of these, they came together, they've all agreed when it comes to Syria. Yep. Everyone's agreed to take this piece of the cake. Turkey, you take Idlib, um, not specifically take it for yourself, but you look after Idlib, you look, you look after those factions, you fund those factions, you, Qatar and Saudi, you play that role. Mm. Whereas um, Iran, Russia, come come in and play this role, you support these groups and you control this region and you support, you prop up Bashar al-Assad. Yep. America comes in and says, we are against uh, Bashar al-Assad, but in the meantime, we are willing to allow Bashar al-Assad to continue ruling and we'll have our forces inside. Okay, and we'll establish bases next to the oil refineries and start taking the resources out of Syria, which is what's happening up until today. So obviously there's a big game that was being, being played there. Everyone played a specific role and they thwarted the revolution, which was a sincere revolution from the beginning yeah. against Bashar al-Assad because he was a dictator and it became into a game of thrones between different various parties. The role of ISIS in the revolution, would you, would you oh. agree that ISIS in the grand scheme of things was not a major player in the revolution? I that there was a sincere revolution from the people, there were armed resistance groups that came up to revolt against Bashar. Started in 2011, ISIS popped up in 2014 when they announced their caliphate. Yeah. In those three years, there were dozens of groups with significant amount of power. Advancements, yeah. Before And advancements as well, before ISIS came in and essentially was used to sort of work on derailing this, along with other groups, yeah. um, whether it was through takfir, whether it was through yeah, infighting, yeah. through derailment of, of, the, of the revolution. Um, the claim that Iran, Iran, like again, like people use this that Iran or Hezbollah got involved to thwart ISIS because they were killing Muslims and this and that. But when you look at it, ISIS was not involved in 2014. So what was Iran doing for three years before that? It's 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 not it's not a legitimate claim that this is the reason they're involved. It was preparing for the arrival of ISIS. Yes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but if we look at the history of ISIS, ISIS yeah. didn't start in Syria. ISIS started in Iraq. Yeah. Okay, um, and and this sectarian game is is a very big. Mm important topic when it comes to what Iran does in the region, what the likes of ISIS do in the region, yep. etc. So ISIS was in Iraq way before the Syrian revolution happened when the American invasion of Iraq happened. Mm. At that time, there was a strong resistance against the American uh, invasion okay, by uh, Shia and Sunnis against the uh, Shia and Sunni Iraqis against the Americans. There was very strong resistance in Fallujah and, uh, and Bar and elsewhere. America knew in order for us to kill off this resistance, we have to create division within the country mm. based on Shia and Sunni. This is where ISIS popped up. First, it was the uh, Islamic State of Iraq. Yep. It popped up there at that time. And somehow they came out as a strong group. The first thing they done is they went to the Sunni um, tribes. And they said to the Sunni tribes, you must give bay'ah to our Amir. And the Sunni tribes were like, who's your Amir? We don't know who your Amir is because... Tribes play a big role in every country. Yep. For you to come and tell them you have to give allegiance to this Amir, where he's not well known, he's not part of a big tribe. Okay, there's something fishy here. Anyhow, they had a lot of power, they had a lot of weapons, and they they made the tribes give allegiance to their Amir. After they rounded up the tribes behind them, and they rallied the tribes behind them, they said to them, okay, now we stop fighting against America, we start fighting against the Shia. Mm because they're a bigger threat to us than America. And this is where they, they played a very dangerous role and the fitna started, propped up by America, propped up by Western intelligence, sectarian fitna, yeah. in order to put the country into this, um, this never-ending cycle of violence between Shia and Sunni and Iraq, of bombings and mosques, etc. that we've seen the, the, the devastation. I remember seeing a graph of sort of number of like um, bombings or attacks between Shia and Sunni in Iraq and it was essentially like this graph that's essentially zero for decades throughout the 1900s and yeah. you get to the US invasion and it just sort of spikes up for the next two decades. Yeah, It just sort of came out of nowhere, this divide and conflict and killings and slaughters that didn't exist beforehand but now all of a sudden there was this significant clash as if the Sunni and Shia in Iraq had always been butting heads but it really wasn't the case. That's right, and, and uh, Shia and Sunni Iraq were living side by side as neighbors. Yeah. There was no issues. There was no talks of the Shia and Sunni mm. conflict. It never existed. Even us as growing up, you never heard about Shia Sunni conflicts. Yeah. 
you know even uh, 2006 Hezbollah war against the uh, Zionist entity mm. everyone was with Hezbollah no one had issues but this sect- sectarian divide is propped up by western intelligence propped up by the by by colonialists in order to divide our countries divide our people in order to serve their interests and as i said they'll play both sides and they'll play both sides yep so isis was playing that side yep and then later on iran comes in and also plays that role of saying that we represent the shia we prop up the shia militias and then they are now playing that role of sectarianism in the region in order to serve its interests and America's interests as well. Yep. And that's where it gets dangerous. And then you had this on the other side, the Saudis as well, who would obviously, but they didn't have a lot of influence on the, on the ground, but they tried to, and they tried to play that role of um, uh, these are the greater enemy, the Majus, etc., etc. You know, they're towing the same line pretty much in order to serve the interests of America, divide the region, keep it weak, keep it keep it busy in, 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 in turmoil and infighting. Mm. And whilst America is taking the resources, expanding its operations, taking over the yep. land and uh, weakening the people and ultimately. Not, not sort of doing it for too long, but again, I think it is a bit important, like Bashar, mm. right? People, like, I'm, I'm surprised to know that we actually see people still supporting him and it's starting to be propped up a bit more by the sort of um, people that sort of support this resistance ally between sort of Iran, axis Russia, of China, oh, axis yeah. of resistance. And um, Bashar is the one who stands up to, to Israel or to mm. America and so on. He's seen as a symbol of resistance. Is there any fact to this historically, even before the revolution? No. There's, <laughs> there's nothing to prove anything of that. Yeah. Um, like it's just it's, it's just seen as, the, so again, like the way that it's tried to be portrayed and it's just like... Uh, propaganda to try to change the image and change the narrative that Bashar has been the symbol of resistance has never been um, him and his father Hafez two uh, oppressors and tyrants in the region who sold the Golan Heights to the Zionists gave up their land um, in exchange for whatever they received in response um, who oppressed the Muslims and uh, you know innocent people within their lands for decades uh, who were um, playing a significant role in oppressing Palestinian refugees even within their lands and then obviously after the revolution that also spiked up um, people revolted against their leader Bashar for a number of reasons and a number of different oppressive policies and then his response was essentially getting his shabih had to pick up the weapons and slaughter yeah. the people en masse yeah. um, thousands killed within weeks um, slaughter, mass rape, mass graves uh, bombings, chemical weapons um, big attacks on uh, Palestinian refugee camps such as in Yarmouk where significant numbers were killed as well um, I say that not because their lives are more valuable than anyone else but of course it's relevant when you're trying to prop him up as the saviour of the Palestinian people yeah. um, and then saved by obviously Iran yeah. and their involvement in the region as well as Russia what people will question is Russia and Amer- Russia was supporting Bashar so how can you say that America supports him as well yeah and you res- like, how, how would you sort of I mean if the same way we say when Iran comes into the region to play a, a part, it takes a piece of the cake, so does Russia. Mm. And they all divide the cake as they see fit. Yep. You know, after World War I, it, was, uh, it wasn't just Britain that sat down and started drawing the map of the Middle East. Uh, it's like a speaker plan and implementing it and then taking the whole piece of the, the whole cake to itself. Yep. It divided the cake with its other allies, its other parties in the region. Mm-hmm. Um, so the same thing happens. Everyone plays a role. Everyone needs to play their role. Um, it can't be just like w- one player and that's it. Yeah. You have this role, you have that role, you have this role. So, and, and, uh, and what proves this is that Russia and American forces are inside Syria operating together. Side by side. And they have never fought at each other. Yeah. So obviously... I think important point that you made as well is that if America wanted Bashar gone, he'd be gone. Just like we saw rulers over the rest of the Arab world go when the people were strong enough against them, America decided it doesn't. Saddam Hussein. Yeah. They wanted Saddam <laughs> Hussein gone, they went in, they took him out. Yeah. Saddam Hussein was stronger than Bashar Assad. Mm. His more regime was stronger. The people. And more support from the people. And more support yeah. from people. Yeah. And, he, and he fired rockets at Israel. Yeah. Whereas uh, Bashar Assad has never. fired wor- words. <laughs> That's right. You know, despite him, cop- them, uh, Syria and Damascus copying. Uh, you know, numerous or attacks against them from the Zionist entity. There's been hundreds of rockets which have hit Syrian territory since October 7 alone. That's, a, that's just that's just, that. just since October 7. Not and there's been response. no response from Syria. Not Zero. a single response, yeah. So that's, that has been, that has been their, their response has been no response. Yep. 
for for as long as we can. I think ever think about two it. things which prove this. I think like irrefutably. Number one is we know that Saudi and the Emirates and these Arab countries that control, for example, the Arab League, yeah. are complete American puppets. They don't act in their region and in their role as leaders of the region, if you want to call yeah. them that, except under American command. Mm. The fact that they've reintroduced Bashar to the Arab League yeah. indicates yeah, they wouldn't be able to do that if not for American pressure, American permission or pressure. Yeah. The fact that they've done that indicates that America is happy for him to remain in power. Yeah. I think another indicator as well is we see how America utilizes this label of terror, terrorist, right, for their own benefit. Um, we see, it, for example, now with the Houthis, and we'll probably talk about the Houthis in a bit as well. Um, Houthis were able to serve us a few, you've a few left, you've years left ago. No one, man. You've I know, right? About I've talked about everyone. Who are you? Um, it's, like, <laughs> it's like you've left, you've left nothing for the criticizers. It's like you've talked about the Arab nations, you've yeah. talked about Saudi, you've talked about Turkey, you've, you've criticized Iran, you've criticized all of them, and you've criticized sectarianism. So who are you? I haven't criticized the Houthis yet. <laughs> No. Um, but they've been able to serve us in the past, right? Yeah. And then uh, they were taken off the terror list and added back on. And now Biden is essentially saying that uh, with Again, the attacks in the Red Sea, if you stop your attacks, we'll take you off the terror list. Yeah, right? exactly. So being labeled as a terrorist is just a political game that we use to sort of put pressure on you to take pressure off you, right? Yeah. When the Syrian revolution started over sort of that period of time between 2011 and 2018, when it was sort of at its peak, almost every single resistance group, which was notable at all, or revolutionary group, um, was labeled as a terrorist by the West. Mm. Whether you want to talk about Jabhat al-Nusra, whether you want to talk about ISIS, if you want to label them as that, whether Hezbollah, you want to talk about Hayat al-Sham, all. all labeled as terrorists. But yeah. Hezbollah wasn't at the time. Mm. And none of the Iranian groups that came in, because the Iranian groups were all operated with, operating within Syria, they came in from yep. Iran, they yep. came in from Iraq, all of these militias. Yep. Um, and Hezbollah came in as well in huge numbers. Mm. And they caused like a huge number of damage, a large number, uh, massive damage on the ground, mm. right? Like they killed tens if not hundreds of thousands yeah. on the ground. Got they burnt cities, they destroyed cities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not one of them was labeled as a terrorist group. They weren't operating under the radar as if America didn't know that they were there. America no, knew that they were there. They went from Lebanon yeah. to Syria. And, and you're talking about like uh, large convoys. Yep. Same thing as from Iraq into Syria, Lebanon to Syria. There's large convoys of military vehicles and military personnel. Yeah. Huge movements. And planes and America's rockets and yeah, yeah. Couldn't pick them up. Yeah. But they were allowed to enter they were allowed to enter in order to play that role that america wanted them to play in that region that's right without being labeled as terrorist groups which indicates that america was happy with what they were doing yeah. but they were labeling all of these revolutionary groups mm. as terrorists mm. so i think these two points alone indicate that iran's role in the region was hand in hand with america's interests yes especially in syria because the thing about the syrian revolution it was, uh, it turned into a purely Islamic sentimental um, revolution. Mm. That means these groups that wanted to topple the regime wanted to establish Islamic governance. And this threatens the interests of America in the region. This is one of the biggest threats to American interests in the region. The rise of Islamic governance, once again. And that's why America had to put all its cards in Syria. It used Iran, it used Russia, it used Saudi, Qatar, UAE, Turkey. It didn't leave anyone that it did not use inside Syria in order to foil the revolution in Syria. So I think this was an exception, exceptional case in Syria where they used all these cards. It went all in in order to foil the revolution in Syria, whereas it didn't do that in Egypt. Yep. It didn't do that in Libya. It didn't do that in Tunis. It was able to um, contain the revolutions in those regions, in those countries. It was, ordered to, it was able to um, orchestrate coups it was ordered to control the new governance and control the people in syria because it was a, a populist movement and we had defections from the syrian army many uh, it, uh, in the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of people of soldiers that defected from the syrian army and joined revolution groups and formed revolution groups that was led by islamic sentiments okay that was calling for Islamic governance, this is where the threat um, to America was um, uh, prominent. And the fact that America did not have a better alternative to the ruling party of Bashar al-Assad, mm. family of al-Assad, they don't have any other alternative. Yep. So they can't just let Bashar al-Assad go because then there'll be a vacuum in that country. And so they had to play the cards right, they had to bring in all these um, different countries and you know they even had a a, um, a, a command center that was attended by 
Russian intelligence, Turkish intelligence, Jordanian intelligence, Saudi intelligence, UAE intelligence, Israeli Mossad, American intelligence. And, they, and all of them were together in this command center. It was in Iraq, in Erbil. And it was overlooking the operations inside Syria mm. in order to thwart the revolution. And this is well documented. Um, anyone can look it up. Yep. Um, and, and you can see the extent that they're willing to go to in order to protect Bashar al-Assad and yep. his rule. Type we move forward a little bit now. Um, because just before we, get, we have to come back to Palestine, the issue of Palestine. Yeah. But I think just one final point that I have to talk about is um, America's recent relationship with Iran, in particular since Trump was re-elected and then Qasem Soleimani. Yes. Um, so again, sort of comes in the back backdrop of Democrats, mm. Obama, making a nuclear deal with uh, Iran, mm. trying to bring Iran back to the table, trying to soften the, the sort of relationship between America and Iran, and then Trump gets elected. And as we said, the Republicans are a lot more harsh in their speech. Because, because if, you, if you look at it, yeah. Iran served them well in the region. That's so right. It's only fair that America now gives them what they want. Nuclear capabilities, mm. Um, ease the restrictions on them, ease the siege on them. You know, the, so it was only fair to do that. But Trump had the support of very extreme right wing factions in in the American American sort of uh, base, right? So it was not seen uh, from his perspective. It was not favorable to sort of be nice to Iran. Mm. And so he came out and he said, "No, nah, I'm going to cancel this nuclear deal that we have with Iran. I'm not going to bring them back to the table. I'm not going to allow the path towards sort of nuclear arms. I'm going to call off this deal." Right now, I think it's important to note that although he was very harsh in his language, although he cancelled this deal, he put sanctions on Iran, um, and he he made life harder for them. Essentially, he was to work with them behind behind closed doors. So remember how we talked about before, like America and the Republicans, especially sort of working behind closed mm -hmm. doors. During Trump's time is when um, the the U.S. allowed the Shia factions in Iraq again, the sort of Iranian proxies, to uh, enter. And America will turn a blind eye towards them and to sort of allow them to reinstate Mustafa Kadhimi as uh, again Iranian backed as the Prime Minister of Iraq. Yep. And in return for that, America also sort of turned a blind eye towards Iran performing trade deals that were against the sanctions that they had yeah. sort of put in place. Um, so even though they had to cancel a lot of deals because of the sanctions, there was a lot of deals that were still allowed to go ahead under the table between American companies and Iran, mm -hmm. um, despite this public display of outrage and clashes between Iran and the US. Now, these clashes kept on going for a period of time, um, but kept on escalating verbally. And as much as you try to control a group, as we yeah. said before, Iran has their interests, their proxies have their interests, their leaders have their interests, yeah. and they'll try to serve those interests sometimes, which is where Qasem Soleimani comes in. Yeah, and, and that's where Trump understands that when America, that the way America's policy towards Iran is, they're playing with fire. Mm. You're playing with fire because you're dealing with a, a, a nation that's... Um, uh, that's maintained the rhetoric of anti-America yep. for decades. Okay, yes, they've maintained that rhetoric. Yes, they have uh, dealings under the table, but you can't come around as Iranian prime minister, as an Iranian strategic uh, advisor, and come to the likes of the militias in Iraq, militias in Syria. Mm. Um, come to the IRGC and say to them, "Hey, look, we're actually mates with America, but we we want we serve their interests. They serve our interests. Um, we're not actually anti-America at the moment. Let's hold off. We you can't do that because yep. you're in the region, in that that's you're in a boiling region where there's constant conflicts and there's American forces, and you've maintained that rhetoric of anti-America for so long. So Trump understands that the moment these guys get nuclear weapons, okay, mm. now they have the ability." to use that as a um, defense strategy against a huge war against Iran, like Russia does today. Every time there's a huge threat against Russia, Putin comes out and says nuclear weapons. Yeah. That's it. That's all he has to say. Just say the word nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, and, and they understand this. And that's where I think Trump sees the, the risk of Iran getting, that nu getting to that nuclear weapons. Because like I said, remember how I said Turkey is it uses that pragmatic line of Let's work with America until we can build our power to be strong enough to say no to America. Mm. Iran might be the same thing, saying we want to build our power to be strong enough. So Trump looks at it and says maybe they, they want to reach that and then when, when they have nuclear weapons, they can say no to America. That's how maybe Trump looks at it. So Trump came in, cancelled the nuclear arms deal mm. uh, or the nuclear deal. He 
reinstated the sanctions on Iraq on Iran. Yeah. And he formally placed in 2018 the IRGC on the terrorist list, which we just talked about. Yeah, and that's because it's a huge step. And the reason why is because by that time now the IRGC has uh, built up huge influence in Iraq, in Syria, towards Yemen. Mm. They've built up that influence. They've built up that military capability. They have militias everywhere. And you had personalities like Qasem Soleimani, even, sorry, Lebanon as well. I forgot Lebanon. It was Hezbollah. Yeah, Hezbollah. Um, Qasem Soleimani, who enjoyed um, this uh, huge power that was given to him within the IRGC, within Iran. He was uh, well respected. Um, he had a lot of uh, 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 his his he had a lot of weight. Okay, um, he had a lot of influence within all the militias, all the proxies, and within Iran. And when Qasem Soleimani um, starts to lead protests and um, uh, they st he starts to lead. Uh, raids into the American embassies in Iraq, into the Green Line, that's where it becomes dangerous. Yeah, and I think Iran, try, uh, sorry, America tried to control, control that even earlier. So it was June in 2018 mm. when they, uh, America, oh, sorry, Iran, Iranian forces shot down a US military drone. Yeah. Right? So the, the very next day, Iran was on high alert. They were like, what's America going to do to respond? You shot down a US drone, right? And they were, they were disagreeing. America said that we're in international waters and Iran said, no, you're over our airspace and so mm. on. They're just fight shooting it down. But of course you shot down a US drone, mm. right? So you're on high alert and they're worried. And the rumors were escalating just like our rumors have been escalated for the last two weeks. What's America gonna do? What's America gonna do? They didn't do anything at the time. Mm. But again, like you see how they have different methods of trying to impose their control. This time they use threats. And what Trump came out and said is essentially, I had a military strike that I was planned to do so but I canceled it 10 minutes beforehand. Yeah. And he said this was gonna be a strike by US forces directly in Tehran. And he said that this US strike could have killed 150 people. Mm. But then he comes out, tries to show himself to be reasonable and says, this wasn't a proportionate response. They shot down an unmanned drone. It's not proportionate for me to go and kill 150 people. So I'm open to some talks. But what he's doing there is that he's showing his strength and his might and he's demonstrating that I'm willing to attack you guys. We we're on the brink of doing it, but 10 minutes beforehand, I stopped. That's a threat, right? And they thought that that might do the job. Mm. And so for the next year, year and a half, there's a sort of tension between them, but they're trying to navigate it using this sort of language until um, that wasn't enough. When the uh, Iraqi military base, a US military base in Iraq was attacked yeah. in late December, 2019, um, several US service members were injured. Iraqi soldiers who probably sort of more loyal to America were injured as well. Um, that's when they went too far. Yeah, and that's where, that's where you have the proxies of Iran. Yeah who are not entirely controlled by Iran, okay? Or might be led by the extreme um, factions from within Iran or extreme personalities from within Iran like Qasem Soleimani, who are, who are willing to toe the line of anti-America all the way and actually put those words into action mm. and start attacking American interests in Iraq yep. and lead these um, uh, proxies against and, and, and direct them towards American interests in the region. And that's where these proxies are now going um, across the red lines of Iran itself. Mm -hmm. This is where Qasem Soleimani is also crossing the red lines that Iran has set out for him. And because he has crossed the red lines, okay, now someone's got to pay the price and there's yeah. consequences. Yeah. America tried to attack first a Kataib Hezbollah base in Iraq. Mm. Um, and they did that and killed 25 fighters, injured 55. That was December 29th. So two days after the American base was Which attacked, year? 2019. Yeah. Um, and then two days later, December 31st, is when the pro-Iranian members and supporters sort of, um, and the groups went and stormed the American embassies in Baghdad. Led by Qasem Soleimani. Yes. And that's, and I think that was so the- Escalation, escalation, yeah. trying to attack, trying to silence. It's not working. They keep on escalating, they went attack the base, mm. attack the embassy. And that's when Qasem Soleimani was killed. And that's where he was killed as a, as a punishment to Iran. And I, but I, th I think Iran was understanding of this because they knew that their proxies and Qasem Soleimani have gone too far mm. beyond what Iran wanted and allowed to. We talked about this, I think in our first podcast, he mentioned about sort of there's certain parameters of where conflict is allowed. Like in, yeah. in, in regions like Iraq, America understands that when we come in, there's gonna be some sort of response. There's gonna yeah. be a conflict, there's gonna be clashes. They don't expect that they'll come in and fight and do whatever they wanna do without any opposition. Yeah. But they'll allow that only within certain parameters. Yeah. Once you cross those parameters, there's, there's, consequences. there's gonna be consequences. Um, 
And we see, like like you said, like Iran sort of seems to understand this by the fact that they didn't really respond to Qasem Soleimani being killed. Like that's a huge assassination that just happened. Yeah. What are you going to do in response? Yeah. They did practically nothing. They called up Trump and they said to him, look, sorry, but we, we're going to have to respond to you. Mm. We have to sh- save face. You killed one of our big guys. And we have to, um, you know, uh, we have to show our, our proxies, our people that we stand by them. And we're just going to bomb this base. There's not going to be any casualties. And please accept it from us. And uh, Donald Trump said to him, all right, go ahead. And there was no casualties. Um, same thing with what's just happened now in the Zionist entity. Okay. Uh, the Americans knew. The Zionist entity knew. They said, we expect a response from Iran. They all expected it. And, we ex- and, and even the Zionist entity said, we accept um, an attack from Iran, a limited attack from Iran that's going to... Um, if it's proportionate. <laughs> proportionate attack that's going to impact some structures in our in our country but it's not going to um, cause any casualties the Zionist entity said this so this is where everyone is playing by the rules of conflict by, by the rules of uh, uh, they say okay there's there's rules for this game that they're playing and everyone's willing to play within these rules okay in order to save face because they have to respond they can't not respond in these instances especially when the Zionist entity has killed high-ranking people mm. from Iran. Like when America killed Qasem Soleimani. There has to be some sort of response. But is that response enough? Is that response going to be sufficient for your proxies? Are they going to be comfortable with what you've just done? Um, your supporters, are they going to look at this and say, okay, that was good enough? Or are they going to say, that was weak? Yeah. You know? Type, yeah. So I, I, th- I think we've got an idea now that um, Iran understands this role. That yeah. I can only operate within the satellite of America. Yeah. And then when I go too far, I face repercussions. So I have to play it safe and I have to make sure that the things that I do are in line with American strategy, essentially. Yeah. Right? I think we've shown enough evidence of that through Iraq, through Afghanistan, through Syria, through the killing of Qasem Soleimani, through their other sort of discussions and negotiations with America, um, dating back all the way to Khomeini and the revolution. Now, Iran has also been very strong in its speech on Palestine. I'm mm. um, talking about, like you said, the road to liberate Al-Quds. Um, they have the Al-Quds brigades. They have obviously Hezbollah, who's essentially just an extension of Iran. That's what we. That's 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 the what we say. But Hezbollah comes out and says, um, "No, we're not. Mm. We're completely independent from Iran. We do things at our own stake. We don't take orders from Iran. Mm. Okay. And Iran is completely separate. That's what that's their claim. Yeah. Okay. So because they make that claim, they can't come out and say. Our, the response the response of the killing of the Iranian officials in Syria is going to come from Hezbollah. Yep. Because even Which means they that they're working hand in hand, obviously. It's just not even hand in hand, it's an extension of Iran. Yeah, yeah, but Hezbollah even comes out and says yep. that Iran is going to respond, not us. Right. Because they claim that they are not an extension of Iran. Mm. So in that instance, when, when Zionist entity kills senior officials of Iran, then the response has to come directly from Iran. It can't come from Hezbollah. Okay. You know, that's, that's their claim, so they have to maintain that. And that's why we saw Nasrallah came out and said that Iran is going to respond to the attack. Yep. Not Hezbollah. Because Hezbollah, Iran, Nasrallah says, we are independent from Iran. We are not, we, we don't wait for Iran to tell us when to attack, when to increase attacks, when to decrease attacks. He said in his speech yep. uh, two months ago, we don't wait for Iran to tell us what to do. Okay, that's, what, that's what they say. Okay. That's their claims. Um, but what we say is that uh, Hezbollah plays an important role for Iran inside the region, inside Lebanon. Yep. Okay. So when it comes to Palestine, mm. what's Iran's stance? Like, what's their interest in? What's their goal in the region? Like, perhaps somebody might say, "Look, they have to operate within the sphere of America, out of inner you know, interest and maslaha and benefit, mm. and we have to try to sort of be gradual with building up our strength." Yeah. Do they have an ultimate goal for Palestine? Like, what's their goal in pa- or in the region broadly, if you want to put it that way? Pa- Palestine is is a token. Palestine is a token that everyone everyone uses in order to garner the support of the Muslims. Because you can't operate in a region that's full of Muslims without having some sort of support from the Muslims because you, otherwise you'll be thrown out from that region. Or if you are supporting proxies or supporting groups in that region, those groups will be looked at as enemies if, if you are not there for the sake of a greater cause. The greatest cause for the Muslims is Palestine. Everyone uses it. Saddam Hussein used it. Yeah. And he gained a lot of support for it. Saddam Hussein, because he fired rockets. That's right. Everyone stands uh, called Saddam Hussein <laughs> in the 1991 years. Yeah. 
they're all the, the same name, you know, 1991, 1990s, 1989, there's all Uday, Qusay, Saddam, so many of them. Yep. In go to Palestine, nearly everyone's a Uday or Qusay or Saddam. So I, I hope today we're not going to wake up and find the uh, Rouhani. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they have to use they have to use this common cause, okay, in order to garner the support of the Muslims to justify their existence in the region and the expansion expansion in the region. And the best cause is Palestine, Al Quds on the way to liberate Al Aqsa. They went into Syria. They killed Muslims in Syria on the way to liberate Palestine. They went into this in Iraq on the way to liberate Palestine. And you know, and then they went to Iraq. They went to Yemen on the way to liberate Palestine. Whereas Palestine is just it took a bit of a detour. Just took the yeah, like, I don't know what there's a detour and then the Red yeah. Sea. Um, so wherever wherever is needed to go on the way to liberate Palestine, but they also miss Palestine mm. throughout this whole time. But now, finally, Subhanallah, there's some they've finally attacked, done some sort of attack on the Zionist entity. Um, but we we need to distinguish something. Um, them playing within uh, the realm of America in the region does not mean that they are playing within the realm of Israel in the region. Yes. Okay. Does not mean that they are serving Zionist interests in the region. Rather, the Zionists see Iran as a um, uh, competitor. As a competitor in the region, because Iran is expanding its influence in the region, expanding its proxies in the region. Okay, and for the Zionist entity, it also wants to expand in the region. Mm. And the competition now is on the resources and on the region. It's not a Islam versus Zionist entity here. It's Israel, Israel versus Ira Iran in the region. Okay, mm -hmm. who can take more land, expand its influence, etc. And the Zionists fear that America would one day, because the Zionists know that, um, that Iran plays by the playbook of America in the region. And that's what they fear the most. They fear the most is that one day that um, Israel becomes a burden on America, a burden on the West, um, becomes so weak that it can't even defend itself like we see today on its own, becomes a burden and it's going to collapse. It's on the verge of collapsing. And America is not going to let the region go loose from its hands, so it has an alternative, which is Iran. Iran plays an important role in the region as an alternative to the Zionist project. So the moment that the Zionist project collapses, they have an alternative that's in the region, a strong alternative, who can keep the region divided and who can keep control over the region and keep in, uh, internal conflicts in the region. And still play within the sphere of America. And still play within the sphere of America and prevent the rise of political Islam in the region. This is the most important you know, part. As you say that as well, I'm just sort of thinking, like over the last two weeks since the Zionists hit the Iranian consulate, the main thing that they've been saying publicly, whether it's Netanyahu, whether it's any of his officials, is that America needs to defend Israel. America needs to support Israel. Yeah. America needs to be with us as we await an Iranian response. They've been pushing so hard publicly, and I'm sure privately as well, mm. to ensure that America is on their side of this conflict. Yeah. And America's had to come out and give those sort of public backings. Mm to the Zionists because as you said, it could be there that they're sort of worried that America would actually potentially, when it comes to sort of an end game conflict, they would prefer Iran over us if Israel's project or the Zionist project has become too dangerous for America to maintain within the Middle East. Yeah, because at the end of the day, they, they operate by what their interests are. We have no friends or allies. No interests. friends or allies, it's interests, yeah. purely interests. And the Zionists played a very important role for the Americans or, or for the West in the region and serve the interests of, of the West, okay, mm. for many decades. Um, and the moment it becomes weak or about to collapse, they do not want that collapse to happen at the hands of Muslims, okay, rather at the hands of someone else who is willing to serve the interests. You're not saying Iran Americans. are not Muslims? The Shia are not Muslims? Uh, Iran is a, is, a is a nationalistic country. Mm -hmm. And they serve the national interest only. Yep, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so rather than a political Islamic entity. Rather than a political Islamic entity. Because even though they call the Islamic Republic of Iran, and they push their Shia ideology mm. as a motivator for their actions, and they encourage these other Shia factions through this talk, and it's very emotional and about 
um, you know, being very Husseini in our yeah. and our revolution and so yeah. on. Um, reality is that, like, obviously, we don't really see that, right? Um, on the ground, especially in Iran, like it's yeah. not as much as they call themselves an Islamic Republic. It's not it's more secular in Iran. Very simple question to ask, and I doubt anybody would disagree, even if it would come from a Shia perspective. If Imam Ali were here today, if the Imam Mahdi was here today, and they were to implement their state and their solution for the problems that we face, would they then go and implement the Islamic Republic of Iran as we see it today? It wouldn't be. No. Right? It would be a lot more Islamic in what we see, whereas Iran is Internally, not. In Iran, it's very secular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a growing number of uh, atheists, huge, yeah. hugely growing numbers of atheists and secular and Iranian, sort of Persian and sort of um, historical. Like, yeah, it's you know, just the, the outlook they use mm. is that a strong Shia empire. And they use that to gain the support of these different proxies That's in Iraq, right. in Hezbollah, in Lebanon, yeah. in Yemen. They have to gain, gain the support of Muslims, like I said. Okay. The same way that Saudi, for example, might use that strong Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, yeah. Quran, Sunnah, Aqidah, the land yeah. of Tawheed. Yeah. To gain the support of the people. Yeah, and at the same time, be divisive in the region by pushing this sectarian ideology. Yep. Which serves American interests. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's, it's, they're serving American interests. It's interesting, like even if Iraq, or if, if Iran, sorry, was this so-called bastion of like Shia, Islam and so on, where Islam is implemented and this Islamic Republic, we would see a lot more like even like there's not many Shia who migrate to live in Iran under their no, rule. None of them do. Right? It's, it's not a thing very, because very really. I think most people recognize it's it's not this Islamic Republic that promotes Islam and whatever version of Islam they want to promote. It's just another secular nation. Yeah, like end of the day. If, if we had a, a real Islamic Khilafah, yep. you would see the Muslims you know, going there in droves to live under it. Because this is it. This is the project, the project for Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. So if they really believe that this is their Islamic project, why don't you go live there? Mm. Simple question, yeah, um, and I think they see through it. I think some of them see through it. To be honest with you, yeah, um, and they don't really take it to be that Islamic republic that they really wish it to be. Um, but regardless of the rhetoric that's that that they that they talk about the Iranian revolution, the Iranians, um, <coughs> these are the facts on the ground. Yeah, these are the facts that we've established. Um, so you can't come around like, you know what, what kills you is that they, people come out and say, oh, but this, our group uh, uh, provided such and such for Palestine. We've provided um, this many thousand of martyrs for Palestine. We've provided money to uh, Hamas or money to Islamic, resist uh, Islamic resistance or money to these resistance groups in Palestine. We've provided weapons. Iran has provided weapons to um, resistance groups in Gaza. How could you talk against Iran? They've, they've, ha they've given them weapons, they've given them money. It doesn't matter. So what if they've given them money? So what if they've given them weapons? Yep. Does that make them infallible? Does that make them um, uh, upon the truth? No. Saddam Hussein also provided. Mm. Uh, Qatar provided. PLR, does that, does yeah. that mean that we have to um, take him as an idol now? You know? This, idea, uh, this notion that when someone presents something for the Palestinian cause, now we have to idealize them and we can't um, criticize them, that's a very da da dangerous notion. Yep. Because when you go up to someone that's poor and you give him $50, do you stand there and remind them every single day, I gave you $50, I gave you $50, you can't talk against me, you have to follow my orders, you have to listen to me, mm. you have to idealize me, I gave you $50, that's what's happening here. You're going to a nation that's occupied and poor, giving them we weapons, giving them money, and with this money and weapons, you are setting um, uh, like exchange expectation. expectations. Yeah. No expectations. It's an exchange. Mm. I'll give you money. I'll give you weapons. In return, you have to thank me in public. You have to raise the flags of uh, Iran in Gaza. You have to fra raise the pictures of Qasem Soleimani and uh, Khomeini, etc., inside Gaza, this is the exchange here. So that when you do this, the Muslims around the world can see, oh, we've provided this for you guys, okay? And now the Muslims can have some sort of sympathy towards Iran. That's what happens here. So when Iran, this is very, we, 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 lucky we touched upon this. When Iran comes and, and, and supports these groups inside Palestine, mm. it's doing it in order to increase its popularity in the Muslim world not in order to liberate Palestine. Yep. And 
the reason why we say this is because the weapons that were given to those groups, the resistant groups, were weapons that, were, that would just keep them resisting and not weapons that would flip the balance of power. Okay, that's number one. Number two, providing something for Palestine without liberating it is never enough, regardless of what you provide. Any country. Whether it's any, aid, whether it's military, it whether it's matter. humanitarian, whether it's food, money. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You want to provide, provide. We're not going to idolize you. We're not going to thank you every day and night. Tasbih for you, subhanahu Iran. Like, you know, some yeah. people, wanna, they, they want to hear this always. Yep. And you have like some Arabs that like, love to idolize someone. The moment that er Erdogan collapses as an idol, they have to look for another idol to idolize. Mm. Or oh, this guy said something good about uh, Palestine, now we have to idolize him. It doesn't work that way. If, if groups, if countries want to provide something for Palestine, okay, that's on them. But don't come out and uh, every day tell us that I gave, I gave, I gave, I gave. If you gave, then you should be for the sake of Allah. And when you give for the sake of Allah, for the sake of Palestine, because it's a wajib, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fard that you must give for the sake of, you must liberate Palestine. It doesn't mean that you come out to speak about it. Mm. As, the, as the Quran tells us when, that when, when you give, you give for the sake of Allah and you shouldn't um, uh, follow, no, when you give a poor person, you shouldn't follow it with making him feel like I've just given you this, you have to thank me for it. Mm. Um, and the same thing for Palestine. You know, so it's a very important notion because a lot of the yeah. people, when you criticize Iran, they say, oh, but Iran gave this, Iran gave that. I don't care what they gave. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And, and there's proof of that as well. Like when you look at, like, there's a few things. So much you could like mention about this because the question is always like, how can you criticize Iran when they do more than anybody else? Yeah, right. But it's clear when you look at the pattern that they do this for their own interest, not for the sake of Palestine. Right. Like, there's a few things. Number one is the fact that they've had trade deals in the past with the Zionists. Right? You wouldn't trade with these people if you saw them as the existential threat. We saw this during the Iran Iraq War. Uh, during yeah, the Iran Iraq War, where Iran sourced spare parts of its American-made military equipment from Israel. They were buying and trading with them, right? And we see like statements from their leaders. Ahmadinejad once said that there's a lot of this propaganda and publicity that Iran wants to attack and invade Israel, but it's just negative publicity. That's his words. He says, it is baseless and not correct. Nobody has ever militarily attacked Israel, mm. referring to Iran. And when we see what they say about their solution for Palestine, mm. um, Ahmadinejad once said that we'd accept a two-state solution. Yeah. Uh, in the Middle East and two state solution, like we did a whole episode on the two state solution, we haven't done that one yet. Mm. But it's it's a, it's a Western solution. It, it's America's solution for the Palestine Israel conflict. Is a two state solution. It's not a Palestinian solution. It doesn't get rid of the occupation. It doesn't liberate the Quds. It is America's solution to destabilize the conflict yeah. and to provide increased or, or yani, to decrease the capabilities of a Palestinian state, right? To decrease the capability of Palestinians to defend themselves and give the Zionists the, the greater piece of the land, 80% of the land. Yeah. And they use this as well in the current conflict, in the current conflict, because it was escalating, the Iranian position came out, official position. Yeah. They said, we call for a peaceful solution, mm. a two-state solution. And peaceful solution, like, it's not like we want war, we want death, but peaceful solution is a loaded term. Um, it's the same word that was used by Mishai, who's Ahmadinejad's chief of staff in 2010. He said, we want a democratic solution. Yep. Right, our solution is absolutely completely democratic solution. Whatever you want to think of democracy as a solution for our problems, or whatever it is, right? Again, like we need to talk about two state solution in a separate episode, but that's the exact same language a peaceful solution, a democratic solution that America uses when it talks about the problem. Yeah, right. You have an occupying military force which is oppressing and killing the people on a day by day basis. That's not the time to be talking about a peaceful democratic solution. This is the time about talking about liberating Palestine, and when you use that language especially when they use it in these settings, which is in the formal um, diplomatic talks, rather than when you're speaking and hyping up the people in front of public crowds, right? If this is the language they're using, it demonstrates that your goal is not the liberation of Palestine. Like we talk about Iran and Hamas, right? Like Iran supplies weapons to Hamas and to Jihad al-Islami and therefore they finance them. And we see it goes both ways. Like there is praise of Iran from these groups. Yeah. And that's what confuses a lot of people as well. It's like we see Hamas and some people might um, you know, they, they might sort of see Hamas as a symbol of resistance mm. and they celebrate their actions and they see them as an Islamic yeah. group and so on. And then they ask, well, why does Hamas then praise Iran? How can you come and criticize them? So it's not praise. Like, I mean, naturally, if I, if, if I was poor and some old uh, Joe comes out and gives me $10, I'll, I'll praise him. Thank you. Yep. There's nothing wrong with praising. Is it loyalty? 
Does Hamas have loyalty to Iran? They've, Hamas has openly stated that they have no loyalty to Iran. Mm. Khalid Mishal in, in an interview. Um, the interviewer asked him, Khalid Mishal is one of the uh, key uh, um, leaders. Former president of Hamas. Yeah, former president. So the interviewer asked him, he said to him, you know, there's a lot of criticism on uh, Hamas's relationship with Iran. Why do you guys go to Iran, etc.? Khalid Mishal said simply, look, we've gone to all, uh, all the Arab nations, we've knocked on their doors and, th- and they've knocked us back. They didn't want to help us. Mm. Then Iran came to us and said, we are willing to help you. But there's conditions. He said, then we said to Iran, um, you can't set conditions upon us. If you want to help us, help us, but you can't set conditions. This is where it's important. Conditions, you know, opening up offices uh, offices for uh, Iranian officials inside uh, inside Gaza or, or whatnot, other, uh, allowing the influence of Iran inside Gaza. These are some conditions that were placed upon them. But Hamas refused these conditions. And so they supported them, um, but it's not ultimate support, it's, it's limited support, money, some weapons, etc. Um, then if with the Islamic Jihad, um, Iran has a greater influence on Islamic Jihad. Mm. So I think Ira- Islamic Jihad would have accepted more of the conditions, and hence they have more influence over Islamic Jihad, and hence Islamic Jihad has a stronger relationship with Iran. Yep. Um, whereas Hamas has a relationship of um, they've received yes some money, some some funding, some weapons, mm. um, and and it stops at that, um, and then they pray, they they thank them openly and they go visit them, etc., etc. Whether that's correct or not, okay, um, we're not we're not discussing that because it's going into too much details here. Yep, um, but essentially it's coming from a position of like pragmatism, and we're in a position of yeah. weakness. We're yes. occupied, and we need to resist, and we need supplies need and weapons and arms. Yeah. And this is who's offering it to us, so we'll accept it. Yeah, and, and we've gone to, we've already gone to the Arab nations, and they all of them have refused to help us. Someone has come out and said, we'll help you. We said, okay, if you want to help us, then ahlo sahla, we're open, we're open for you to help us. We're not going to reject. That's that's their position. We see as well, obviously, they accept the help from Qatar as well, especially diplomatically. Yeah. When Morsi was in power in Egypt, yep. they leaned a lot more, of, of course, to the Ikhwan and to Morsi than they did towards Iran. And obviously, we see during the Syrian revolution, yeah, the Iran people. called upon Hamas and said, support Bashar. Mm. And Hamas refused. They refused. And Hamas publicly supported the rebel groups against Bashar. That's where, uh, that's where um, Khaled Mish'al, he came and he said, we operate based on our masalih, our interests. Yep. But the moment that our interests do not align with our principles, we're going to go with our principles, not our interests. Mm. So when he came to Bashar al-Assad in Syria and the revolution, he said, this is where our principles were being tested and our interests, and we chose our principles over our interests because our, in that time, the interest was to stay in, in Damascus. Absolutely. They offered to stay in Damascus and stay with Bashar and prop him up because this is the axis of resistance, yeah? But no, they chose their principles at that moment because they knew that Bashar al-Assad was being oppressive and the revolution was against a tyrant leader. And so they took the stance, a principled stance and they left Damascus. Okay? And there was repercussions for that and there was a fallout between them and Iran after that. They went even further. Like Hamas and Al-Qassam would hold protests in Gaza in support of the Syrian revolution against Bashar. Yeah. They gave permission to their fighters outside of Gaza, outside of Palestine, those that were in Lebanon and Syria, to join these rebel groups. And there were like many recorded incidents of Qassam fighters mm. who were joining these groups and fighting against the Syrian army. Yes. And they were doing it under the banner and like publicly stating that we are um, we're from Hamas and we're from Al-Qassam. Yeah, and that's so, where yeah. they had a fallout with Iran. Yeah. A, a bit even, of even Jihad al-Islami, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, mm. were silent on the matter. So they didn't as far as Hamas to go openly against Bashar, mm. but they also refused to speak openly against uh, in support of Bashar against the revolution yeah. which is when we see Iran's underhanded tactics that again demonstrate is this really for the sake of Palestine for the sake of Gaza is it for the sake of Islam that's when they propped up the Asabirin movement right mm. Asabirin was a new movement that they formed uh, in 2014 by Hisham Salim who split from Palestinian Islamic Jihad after they refused to comment in support of Bashar mm. and they formed Sabirin movement right or Harakat Sabirin in Gaza a new group who was now loyal to Iran um, he would repeat the slogans, the road to Al-Quds passes through Karbala. Yeah, yeah. And they were funded big time, $10 million every month by Iran. Mm. And that's where Iran's support was going, right? So it's, it shows like, it's, 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 we scratch your back, you scratch ours. We support you and finance you. You have to support us. But Hamas, who maintains 
control in Gaza, they maintain the power in Gaza, yeah. banned the group, they dissolved the group with force, and they said, no, you're not allowed to operate here. Mm. And as a result, Iran's plan to sort of try to undermine Hamas and Jihad al-Islami in Gaza failed. Yeah. But it just shows like the fact that you're willing to, to sacrifice your support for these groups and to create your own group and to prop them up and to finance them on the condition that they support your interests in the region yeah. demonstrates that it's about my personal interests. That's right. It's not about supporting the people of Palestine with their, with their actions. It's not about supporting the Palestinian resistance groups. It's about I support them as long as they support me. Yeah, and it's, about, it's not about liberating Palestine. It's about um, just it's tokenistic support in order to garner the support of the Muslims around the world. Because when the Muslims look at um, Hamas or Palestinian resistance groups praising Iran and saying thank you Iran, then they say, oh, Iran must be the good guy. It must be good for supporting. Yeah. But if you look at all these facts that we've presented, then you can draw to a conclusion that Iran does this for its own national interests, mm. nationalistic interests in the region. Um, and I don't. I think it's very hard to deny this when yeah. you're presented to all these evidences. And then, like you, you said as well, like the fact that, like again, like some people might go to the extreme of saying that Hamas is controlled by Iran, whether that's propaganda from the West to try to make Iran seem somehow, you know, as as if they're controlling everything, or to give them more esteem or more 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 prestige in the region. Um, but obviously, it's not the case. Like when we saw what happened on October seven, Iran came out very clearly and they said, "We didn't know about this. We were not behind this." Uh, Khomeini met with the leaders of Hamas when they came to Tehran and essentially said, you gave us no warning of October 7th account yeah. uh, attack and we will not enter the war on your behalf, yeah. right? Like, again, today, I don't know what's happened over the past two hours while we've been speaking, mm. but Iran has come out with these attacks on the Zionist entity, the, like probably one of the largest scale attacks, if not the largest external attack mm. on the occupied Palestinian territories. And people might see this again as a form of resistance and its liberation of Palestine against occupation and so on. But it's interesting to look at the facts, like just a couple of weeks ago, everyone was criticizing the West because they've been silent on the deaths of 30,000 Palestinians. But then there was uproar around the world with the media and world leaders because seven aid workers from the World Central Kitchen were killed. Yeah. Iran has done nothing yeah. for 190 days until seven Iranian officials were killed yeah. in this bombing in Damascus, yeah. right? Why is that your red line? Like, are these seven lines more precious than the 30,000 Palestinian lines, lives, mm. right? If you want to come from the perspective of an independent state with your nation state borders, then yeah, fair enough. My, my lives are more important than somebody else's. Yeah. These are my borders. These are my people. This is what I need to protect. But if you want to talk from Islamic perspective, you can't justify staying yeah. silent on the 30,000. That's right. If you want to say that my goal is the liberation of Palestine, supporting the people of Gaza, it's clearly not. Because you haven't taken these steps, if this is the extent of your, let's say that this is the extent of their capabilities, or this is what they're willing to do. Mm. They're willing to do what, they're willing to draw this line and to intervene militarily and to send their drones and their missiles in response to seven Iranians getting killed. Mm. Why not in response to 30, 40,000 Palestinians? Yeah. Are these seven lives worth more than the 30, 40,000, right? Yeah. Clearly here, Iran's goal is Iran's interest. Yeah. Iran's goal is not to liberate Al-Quds. Iran's goal is not to liberate Gaza. Iran's goal is not to save Muslim lives against the Zionist occupation. Mm. Iran's goal is to protect Iranian interests and to maintain the power or the image of Iran in the region. Yeah. It's very clear from their actions. Yeah. We see this, like even when you look at, like since October 7, again, like people respond and say, well, hold on, Iran has been doing things because you look at Hezbollah and their actions on the northern border. You look at Kata'ib, Hezbollah, Hezbollah in Iraq and what they've been Hezbollah doing. Hezbollah comes and says, we've got nothing to do with Iran. So do you take the word for it or? <laughs> I don't, but that's what they say. So, so if you're going to take their word, word. Let's take their word. Sure. That means Iran hasn't been doing anything. Okay. And then uh, Houthis come out and do attacks and the Houthis say Iran has no control over us. And okay? Iran says the Houthis are not, yeah. we're not controlling the Houthis as well. Yeah. So it so goes both ways. So there goes the Houthis, there goes Hezbollah. And then we had the, the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi militias that were attacked, atta the attacked American base on the, on, the, on the border of Jordan and that injured some uh, American soldiers, seven soldiers, I think. Uh, three months ago or so. Yep. And America came out strongly and they threatened, they warned Iran, they said to Iran, control your militias in Iraq. And after that, they actually controlled their militias in Iraq. Kata Attacks against Hez American bases decreased and they stopped. Kata'ab Hezbollah Secretary General Abu Hussein al Hamidawi noted that many of its allies, in particular Iran, and quote, often object to the pressure and escalation against the American occupation forces in Iraq and Syria. The Secretary General of Kata'ab Hezbollah in Iraq Mm. is saying that our actions are being objected to by Iran. Exactly. So it's either you take the word or you don't. If you're going to take the word, then Iran is not behind these actions and Iran has not intervened and Iran has not done anything for Palestine or for Gaza for the past seven months. Yeah. 
And if you don't take the wood, that means uh, Iran has been turned to tokenistic. Okay, um, Houthis. I be, uh, believe that Iran is not directing them to increase their attacks. Uh, rather, Iran would have told them to decrease their attacks. To okay, you've done a bit of attacks. That's it. You know, hold off. America is already you've pissed off America, and you've uh, impacted the Red Sea, and Houthis have. have clearly said no, we're not going to stop. They've clearly said no to the Iranians, we're not going to stop until the aggression in Gaza stops. Houthis are different than um, the other uh, proxies. It's in the interesting, region. I speak to somebody recently and I mentioned some criticism of Iran, Iran's involvement. Mm. And he said, well, how about the Houthis? He said, essentially, um, you're b it's sectarian. It, the, my, my criticism of Iran was sectarian. Mm. And he referred to the Houthis. I said, hold on, it's sectarian to say that any Shia or any Shia group is operating purely under Iranian command mm. to say that no Shia group can act independently of Iran and that there's this sort of, you know what I mean? To, to sort of directly label them all as under one umbrella, right? Mm. These are different groups with different goals, with different objectives, even different strands of Shiaism, right? But they, these are closer to the Sunnis than the Shia. Yeah, I, I like it sort of uh, creedally and, but yeah. it, I wouldn't even say that any of this is sort of driven by some creedal. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah. not, I'm just saying. Yeah, but uh, sort of, I, I think it's 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 wrong to sort of label any of this. And the Houthis have worked very closely with Iran, especially in the conflict in Yemen and against Saudi and the Emirates and so on. Mm. Um, but again, clearly we see by America listing them and unlisting them as mm. terrorists and so on that there is obviously the political game being played there. Mm. Um, the Houthis, without going into this topic, of course, have played a big role in the damage in Yemen over the past decade without going into that topic. Um, but obviously they've taken these actions in the Bab al Mandab, in the Red Sea. Which is to, praise, praiseworthy. Yeah, to, to divert any 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 yeah. trade routes and economic routes towards the Zionists. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, there's no indication that this was directed by Iran or done under the guidance of Iran. Having said that, now that Iran's interests have been threatened, mm. it's likely that Iran would direct the Houthis to increase these attacks now. Yes. To, to defend Iran's interests, not to defend the Palestinians, yeah. right? And I think that even overnight sort of or with the Iranian attacks, we've seen um, some increase in Houthi attacks. And also in Hezbollah the, attacks. Yes. At the same time. That's right. So coordinated. So which one is it? Are you controlled yeah. or not controlled? But coordinated when yeah. Iran's interests are under threat. Yeah. Right? When Iran's interests are not under threat, and it's just the Palestinian people being killed, it's 30,000 of your people. It's 15,000 50, of your children. Yeah. So we don't have to intervene. Okay, so now an important question. Mm. You know, you've criticized all the uh, Shia militias in the region who are the only ones doing something for Palestine and for Gaza today, whilst all the Sunnis are not doing anything. Where's the Sunnis? Shia are the only ones helping. Yeah. This and is that's, criticism. that's the response that most people will give. This is a criticism. Yeah. They are the only ones doing something. Where's the Sunnis in all this? You know, so at least they're doing something, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's when the question comes, what's your standard? What are you looking for when you ask for support? Is your standard, Mohammed bin Salman, Sisi, King Abdullah, is that your standard that you're comparing to? Is that what we're saying? These guys are doing nothing. If you perform better than these guys, I love you, I support you, you're the best, right? What's our standard? And that's where the question comes like, our standard and our goal is a liberation of Palestine and the complete removal of occupation, right? Mm. If that's not your goal, then you don't share the same goal. If your actions don't work towards that, then you're not working towards the same goal, right? Our standard is not these Arab leaders or these Muslim leaders or these Sunni leaders. They don't represent They've them. sold out a long time. And everybody knows, like we said at yeah. the start of the episode, right? Like everybody knows that these are complete set out puppets who serve American, American interests, American right? Western interests and Israeli interests, right? Zionist interests. Yeah. Um, then they're, they're not the standard. But what we do see is that, for example, the people on the ground, like the, like again, like if, if you want to ask like, is it Sunni, is it Shia, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not about criticizing Shiaism, right? It's about looking at the intro, like the genuine actions that have been going on and the genuine uh, emotions and sentiments, yeah. which I think we've demonstrated pretty pretty clearly that Iran's sentiments are not for the liberation of Palestine. Who does have the, have the sentiments are the people on the ground, yeah, Sunni yeah. and Shia. Even, even Shia, people part of Hezbollah, etc. They're, they're all sincere. 100%, the 100%. And yeah. I would say a lot of pop, the people within the Houthi militias they're and within the Kitab Hezbollah in Iraq and their yeah. militias and those that exist within Syria and the rebel groups um, and, uh, and HTS and the people on the ground in Jordan and the people on the ground in Egypt and the people on the ground in all Muslims of these nations. Large. Muslims at large, Sunni, Shia, whoever you are, are completely in support of the liberation of Palestine, right? But just like I don't say Saddam Hussein was an ideal leader because he sent rockets towards the Zionists, whereas nobody else did, just like we don't prop up 
whatever actions Turkey, were undertaken Saudi, by MBS. Or, or, or even if you want to go back further back like towards the uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser yeah. and towards the actions of the Arab leaders back then in the 67 war and mm. so on who who stayed if they had a war supposedly a six day war against yeah. the Zionists they didn't liberate Palestine and their goal was never to liberate Palestine which we say now in retrospect right yeah Iran's goal is not to liberate Palestine the the, the and so they're not the standard these yeah. other these other leaders yeah. and I don't compare you to them to say you're doing a good job I'll give you a pat on the back yeah my question is do you meet the standards of what's needed to liberate Palestine yeah and the answer is no yeah and are your actions in the region for the past few decades have they been directed towards liberating Palestine or have they in turn rather helped stabilize the Zionist entity further how through peaceful UN resolutions through establishment of allowing um, UN forces, peacekeeping forces, through handing over Golan Heights, through many various, you know, uh, after after battles, it's, where, where it's important is after the battle ends, not during the battle. That's so right. If there's a war, there's a war. But where it's very dangerous, where it's very important to watch out, to be careful is after the war ends. What are the political re um, repercussions of that war? Will they further enable the Zionists or will they weaken the Zionists? That's where it's important. Will they bring about resolutions and UN resolutions and UN peacekeeping forces who would give more land to the Zionist entity and protect the Zionist entity and prop up the Zionist entity? Or is this war, the result of this war, going to weaken the Zionist entity? This is where it's important. Yes, right now, there's a lot of pressure on the Zionist entity. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big war. It's a, the Zionist entity has been weakened. But the Iran has now... Is, is, um, struck the Zionist entity, but will these strikes be used as a catalyst for ending the war, ending the genocide in Gaza, and signing new deals, uh, new peace treaties, uh, new, U new UN resolutions, hmm. um, will, like what happened in the 1967 war, 19, no, no, 1970, 1967, 1973 war, and even the, 2006. And even 2006 war. There's previous wars against the Zionist entity, which ended in treachery, ended in signing peace deals, UN accords that protect the Zionist entity. This is where it's important that we need to really watch out for. Yep. Um, Hala, even like we see what's happening right now with Iran responding as we're speaking. So we don't know how this will end up and where it will go. But it's interesting when you look at the last couple of weeks as well. So after the Zionist attacks, so I think the important question that people ask is, well, why did Israel attack Iran or attack an Iranian consulate, right? They attacked Iranian interests. Um, I think part, part of the reason there is the Zionists are worried, like you said earlier, about sort of America, America abandoning them in this conflict. Mm. Um, Zionists, especially the current leadership, are very much hell-bent on war. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to take over Gaza, they want to enter into Rafah, um, they want to enter into southern Lebanon, mm -hmm. they want to take on Iran, they want to rope America West into Bank. this conflict, enter into the West Bank, which we've seen escalating heaps over the last day or two, yes. taking Jerusalem, we talked about the Red Cow a couple of episodes ago. Um, they're very much intent. What happened to the Red Cow? I've got people asking me about the Red Cow. <laughs> nothing's happened so far, so we've been waiting. Um, there's been some whispers of things happening, but nothing, yeah. nothing so far. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like there's, just there's too there's much too pressure. There's too much pressure on the Zionist entity, and like I said, like we said in the episode, that there could be a big likelihood that they're going to postpone it mm. because there's already too much commotion going on in the background, mm. and America's putting a lot of pressure to end the war, not going to Rafah. Um, that's it. You haven't achieved the objectives, and this is where the Zionist entity said, "You know what? America's putting a lot of pressure. Let's drag the America into this war even further. Let's escalate things in the region even, even further." Let's light the fire even further to keep this war prolonging and drag America further into this war. We touched on this earlier, but how do you, like, what's your take on Iran's point about, like, strategic patience as they're being attacked mm. and they're saying, we want to build up our nuclear arms, we want to but build up our strength until we can eliminate the Zionist force. Why, why didn't you have strategic patience when it came to uh, the Muslims in Iraq or the Muslims in Syria? Where was this uh, wisdom and patience at that time? instead of going in and supporting Bashar al-Assad all the way, popping him up, or helping the American invasion of Iraq, or helping the American invasion of Afghanistan, where's his strategic patience then? Shouldn't you be using, be using strategic wisdom and strategic patience when it comes to your fellow Muslims in the region, rather than strategic patience against the Zionist entity, knowing full well that if you do strike the Zionist entity with your full force, 
you're going to have the support for all the Muslims around the world. Knowing full well. And knowing full well that you've mentioned that you can destroy Israel in seven minutes. So, Unless they were lying. Huh? Unless they'll admit that they were lying. And it took two, <laughs> what, uh, seven hours for the, no, three hours for the missiles to arrive. Uh, the, 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 the drones, seven to nine the, hours. The drones, yeah. So if seven minutes, <laughs> depends, but they might have quicker. quicker the ballistic missiles. miles take 12 minutes. So they're a lot faster. 12 minutes. If you send enough of them. Yeah, but they were very quick to go into Syria. Yep, that's right. So they have the capacity and capability to, they, I mean, they're, they're, they're in Syria already. Shot. They're yeah. in Syria already. Yep. Between them and the Zionist entity, there's a border. That's right. Just they, it's there. You get what I'm saying? So strategic patience, okay. I don't know what that means. I think if you're, if you're in a situation where you know, things are a bit more settled and you're building up towards a conflict, mm. you can use a strategic patience card. But when you're at a situation where there's an ongoing genocide, yeah. 40,000 have been killed. Yeah. If you're going to lose your patience over seven of your own being killed, yeah. but you don't lose your patience over 15,000, 20,000 children being killed, mm. what's this patience that you're speaking about? You know what I mean? Is it, if, you have you have tolerance towards uh, Palestinian lives, but no, to no tolerance towards your own? Yeah, like if it's genuinely strict, like why didn't they do this attack that we're talking about today, mm. 14th of April? To stop the genocide. Why didn't this happen on October 7th? Yeah. Why didn't it happen here? Like I said, oh, after oh, when the land in, when the, and interesting, like when the land invasion started, the Zionists were teasing a land invasion for weeks, three weeks before they eventually went in. Right? It's interesting that, like, especially when you look at their sources and their media, what they're reporting and their intelligence, and that they were weighing up all of these possibilities: a land invasion, there's Gaza attacking us, there's a northern border with Hezbollah, and we're worried about Iran getting involved as well. It was at that point in time that Ismail Haniyeh went to mm. Iran. And he met with Khomeini, uh, Khamenei. And that's when Iran came out and said, we weren't warned about October 7 and we won't be getting involved. Mm. And it's right after that, almost the very next day, that the Zionists went in with a ground invasion. Yeah. Almost as if they were waiting for the green light that Iran is not going to get involved right. before we go in on the ground. We're not going to further escalate and get attacked from multiple fronts. We have the green light to go ahead. That's right. They were worried about escalation. And they now that they have the green light that Iran is not going to come in and escalate on their terms, mm -hmm. we'll go in and we'll invade on the ground. And now they can try to escalate on their own terms. And nor is Hezbollah going to come in um, with a strong force into, into the battle. Mm. And uh, Nasrallah came out and said, we're, um, uh, we're only going to get involved if Gaza is about to fall. That's right. If it's about to fall, okay? That's what Nasrallah said in the speech. Um, but they did start um, firing rockets as a defense measure because they knew that if Gaza falls, they're next. Yep. And and the threat is still up until and today. Their rockets and strikes have been controlled. Yeah, but it's defensive. These are defensive. And it's, yeah. These are like playing within the what's acceptable internationally. Mm. Okay. I strike yeah, within you within conflict these zones, bases. military yeah, base. They're striking each other really. They're yeah. killing here and there. Um but this is within what's acceptable boundaries where you're not gonna bring the wrath of America against you and America's gonna come in with the Zionists entered against Hezbollah and against Lebanon, even though the Zionists have been trying to escalate things in the region by bombing inside the Dahi Junubiyya. Um, uh, bombing in Beirut. Beirut. When they killed Sarah Al-Aruri. Yeah, and they bombed Beirut. They've gone into the depth, even though before Nasrallah said, if they bomb Beirut, we're going to go to war, and then they bomb Beirut. Mm. It's, like, it's like the Zionists saying, okay, you said you're going to go to war, let's go. They're testing. That's right. We want you to go to war. We want you to escalate. We want to drag America into this war because it's for their in the Zionist interest that America comes into this war. In, in, uh, because they, 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 they had too much pressure from America to end the war. Um, and this is where they said, you know, we're going to keep attacking um, uh, leaders from Hezbollah, leaders from the Iranian forces, lest they respond in a strong manner so the regional escalation can increase, which will, they, they believe, the Zionists believe this will benefit them because the eyes of the world will now go to a regional conflict whilst the genocide continues in Gaza, whilst the settlers let loose in West Bank and the settlement the settlements expand in the West Bank, they kick out the Palestinians from the West Bank into Jordan, they kick out Palestinians from Gaza into Egypt, they take over Jerusalem, they slaughter the red cow that they have uh, uh, brewing on the side right now. They carry out these plans that they want to carry out, okay, whilst maintaining the eyes of the world and the news of the world on now a different battle that's taking place in Syria, in Lebanon, um, with the Iranians and whatnot. Strategic patience. And uh, there will be no more strategic patience left yeah. at that time. For how long do you say patient? Until how many of your generals are killed? Until how many innocent 
Palestinians, innocent Muslims are killed. Right. This is the testing times for them. Yeah. It's testing everyone. Even when we talk about like Hezbollah's involvement in this conflict up in the north, yes, they've been involved. Yes, they've had some shuhada. Yes, they've um, had some level of sort of strikes and so on. But the level of involvement has been practically nothing when you compare to what they did in Syria, for example. Yeah. The extent oh. that they entered, the number of soldiers that they deployed, the number of rockets that they deployed. Um, it's, it just shows how, how, how much seriousness they gave and gravity towards the Syrian situation to protect Bashar versus how much gravity they give to the situation to protect Gaza and to protect the people of, people mm. of Palestine. Yeah. Um, I think an important point to make about that as well is I guess maintaining our principles, like you said about sort of the quotes from Khalid Mishal earlier, like what are our principles, right? Like I think about, for example, yani, yani, if I'm going to be completely blunt, the Republic of Iran is an enemy to Islam. When you look at them facilitating the invasion of Iraq, them facilitating the invasion of Afghanistan, what they did in Syria, and like honestly, what we see in Gaza today is horrible. What we saw in Syria was as bad, if not worse. Like some of the scenes that we saw there, the cases of rape, the cases of just like these mass graves, displacement, like 4 million have been displaced from Syria, 5 million, Apes. more, more. Um, one million, up to 1 million killed, barrel bombs. Um, children, barrel bombs, complete destruction of cities. Aleppo today looks like Gaza does still after the war. Like when you look at that, and this was done by Iranian militias, Iraqi militias supporting um, Bashar, as well as Hezbollah, of course, involved there. Like these are, these are butchers. These are people that spilt Muslim blood. These are people that had no had had no care for killing innocent Muslims, innocent children, innocent women that raped them, that were forcing we saw like the Shabiha of Bashar and Iranian militias as well, forcing people to like worship images of Bashar. Mm. Things like this that you look yeah. at and it's like it's like the worst of crimes that they've committed, right? These are not people to support. These are not friends, these are not allies. It's like Sisi. When you look at Sisi's regime, this is not a regime they support. They're worse. The what they're they worse. did is worse. It's much worse. It's much worse. Yes, definitely. But like I'm saying, it's the same. All tyrants. Yeah. It's all tyrants. It's like it's like you know when we look at, for example, the Syrian revolution mm. and why it was derailed. A big part of the reason that it was derailed was because America managed to come in and influence these rebel groups yeah. by supplying them with arms and weapons, they and they used them. Turkey and they used Qatar and they used yeah. the Emirates and so on to supply them with weapons as well. But of course, when you're supplied with weapons, it's never for free. Yeah, there's conditions. And supplied with arms, always conditions. And then they use this to try to detract from these groups. They assassinated some of their leaders and they derailed their message and their mission, right? When you, like imagine today, America was going to come in and say, do you know what? We're going to fund all of the Palestinian resistance groups to fight against Israel. Yeah. Would anybody trust them? Definitely not. Even if they offered millions of dollars worth of weapons, even if they ordered, offered the most advanced of weaponry, we would say, Hey, these guys but are American, our enemy. But America didn't directly fund these groups. They, they funded them through Qatar, through yes, Saudi, yes. through Turkey. But I'm just giving an example, right? Mm. Like to show how them funding yeah, derailed yeah. the revolution, right? If America was coming and try to fund groups in Gaza or Palestinian resistance groups, we also wouldn't trust them. America tried that through Qatar and they told Qatar to um, allow, uh, allow to encourage Hamas to go through the elections in Gaza. Mm. That's number one. And then when Hamas won the elections and they were surprised, okay, they didn't expect it to win the elections. Qatar then, um, America taught Qatar to open up a political office for Hamas in Qatar. Yes. In Doha. Okay. And that was in a move to contain Hamas and to pull them into a trap. Now you are in control like of in Gaza. A game. Now you are responsible for the lives of people in Gaza. Now you have to play by the rule book. Otherwise, there's going to be a siege on you. You're responsible for the lives of the people of Gaza. Okay. What you do is going to directly impact the lives of the people of Gaza. And they try to contain them through that and try to uh, push them um, towards the same path of the PLO, okay, which is, we'll go into this topic when we talk about two-state solution. we we'll talk about all these other groups that propped up in the Palestinian uh, resistance before. Um, and so they tried to do that. And then what happened on the 7th of October, um, it so went beyond, beyond all these attempts to contain the Palestinian resistance groups, yep. where they wanted to keep Palestinian resistance, but keep it at a level of Barely trying to resist occupation and just you know throwing just rocks, existing. Molotov cocktails, yeah. existence, etc. Not go beyond those red lines of what's acceptable under international world order, under America, mm -hmm. um, and those red lines were broken on the seventh of October by breaking those barriers uh, on Gaza by going inside the occupied territories. Okay, and that's where the wrath of the international world order came about. The same way the, the wrath of the international world order 
came against the people of Syria for stepping beyond those red lines that are drawn by the international world order. Yeah. But like, e even if these plots didn't exist, if America just came out one day, let's say Biden wakes up one day and he goes, look, he said it a few weeks ago, my wife tells me, you know, this is too much. Oh, yeah, in this said, war. Look, my wife told me a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's Biden. It's Biden. Yeah. Um, if he says, you know what, I've woken up to what my wife is advising me and yeah. I'm going to actually, you know, I'm going to, end the war in Gaza and I'm going to support the removal of the occupation. Nobody's going to believe it, right? Like this is our enemy, right? Yeah. Even if he came and you're going to say there's a plot behind this. This is somebody who has no issue with the amount of people that have been killed. This is somebody that has yeah, no issue killing Muslims. Of course. Right? Why is it when you look at Iran and you see what they did in Syria? Like somebody who's killed this many people is not your ally no matter what they do. They don't share our interests. They don't share our principles. Yeah. They don't share our interests. Yeah. They don't share, like no matter what, these are not people who abide by Islamic principles. It's, Look, it's because, unfortunately, uh, the Muslim Ummah has been bogged down in this uh, nationalism, okay, where people only care about what's happening within their national boundaries, in their, can their countries only. So as an Egyptian, I care about what's happening in Egypt. As a Jordanian, I care about what's happening in Jordan. I don't care what's happening in Syria. That's their issue. That's their problem. It's a uh, civil war. Whereas the Syrians now know what the Iranians are really are, are, are about. The Syrians know the reality of the Iranians. So they will never support the Iranians. And they're very skeptical about the Iranians, okay? That's right. But to be fair, especially with what Iran just done now, a few hours ago against the Zionist entity, the majority of the comments are people that are skeptical, even within Palestine, within Gaza. Yeah. Which shows the, That's right. It's a, a, the, it's, it's, a, a theater, it's a theater. Yeah. It's a theater. Yeah. A theoretical. Theatrics. theatrics. Yeah. So uh, it's a theoretical play. What is it? Yeah. So that's that's what people are saying. So people are beyond these tokenistic attacks. They're beyond all these um, uh, acts of show, show, show or trying to garner support or whatnot. People know they're not. It's not like before. There's a lot of awareness in Ummah, okay, and they know that what that whatever that does not equ equate to changing the balance of power or equate to the liberation of Palestine is not sufficient anymore. Yeah. The bar has been set high now. We saw what a few handful of people can do on the 7th of October by breaking the barriers and going to occupy Palestine. Now no one has an excuse from the Muslim world, from the Muslim armies, from the Muslim regimes. No one has an excuse to say, oh, we can't do anything, we're weak, this is that. Yeah. It's interesting when you look at like what was done on October 7 and how it took the Zionists by surprise mm. and it caused significant damage to them, right? Um, when you look at what Iran did this morning, 200 rockets sent, but with the amount of chatter that was happening beforehand, America was clearly like in the loop yeah. when they were their intelligence officers was reported by Axios, was reported by Reuters from American intelligence, from Zionist intelligence. Iran will attack on Sunday morning. There will be an Iranian attack within the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, Iran will send drones and missiles from Iranian territory. Yeah. They will attack through like it was this was discussed for two weeks. Yeah. It almost seems like there was a negotiation back and forth. When you yeah. look at the amount of quotes and back and forth, yeah. that there was a discussion and a back and forth between Iran, between Biden, between maybe not the Zionists directly, um, but trying to negotiate what is the acceptable level of response. Yeah, can I use this weapon? Can I use that rock? Yeah. No, you can't. Use that one. Use this one. And to find out though, like Iran's going to attack within the next 20, 24 hours, they're going to attack on Sunday morning. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Right? And then when they did attack, the American... Tanks, uh, the American planes, sorry, and aircraft carriers were, were already there. The American air bases in Iraq and in Syria were already prepared to intercept some of these, as well as in Jordan. The Jordanian army was already ready to intercept some yeah. of these drones, saying that we won't allow our airspace to be used for this. The Zionists had already set up all of their defenses. They had closed out, closed their schools. They had closed their businesses. Mm -hmm. They had sent their people into their shelters. Um, Netanyahu was already in a bunker. His, uh, the, his, his plane the Israeli uh, parliamentary plane that's used by the president was already ready to take him and sort of fly to wherever he needed to be. The war cabinet was already meeting. And of these 200 rockets that were sent, only a couple made impact. Right, before that 200 rockets. And then Biden called up Rouhani and said, okay, everything's ready. Yeah. Go ahead, fire. Yeah. Like okay. genuinely, yeah. if if not in that, like that's almost exactly how it played out. Like yeah. literally, like when you see what's been happened, what's happened, and then they sent these UAVs, which will take nine hours to reach. So you've got they're nine hours waiting. set up your defenses. They're sitting there for nine hours. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when are they going to arrive? And like then there's the reports of the of the drones being seen in Iraq, and then reports Jordan. that the drones are being seen in Syria, then in Jordan before they finally reach to these areas. So yeah. it's all like you look at that and you're like, is this the extent of the damage that you can do? Obviously, it's not right. Yeah. It's an acceptable damage, acceptable response which hasn't caused significant damage to the Zionists yeah. 
um, very few of those rockets actually managed to cause any strike or those drones. And those that did strike, so there was a air base that was struck in the Naqab mm. um, desert or an, an air base, which it seems like there's only been very minor damage. Mm. There's been reports of three casualties that have been reported in one place, Zionists or Zionist settlers. That were, Apparently that in were, Jordan, there was three casualties as well. Three casualties in Jordan because of one of the yeah. uh, drones that was shot down and then it's debris yeah. that fell down. Um, one child yeah. from a Muslim family, a 10-year-old, that died in, in the Naqab apparently. Mm. Unclear if that was from one of the rockets hitting or from probably an iron dome missile that intercepted yeah. it and then the debris that fell. But no significant damage. Despite yeah. all of this, no significant damage. Yeah. Because you've given time and opportunity for all of these defenses to be set up. People will prop this up, those who support Iran, as this is the Iranian resistance and the support, and Iran has written its name in history they books and whatever. They, yeah, they but they've done nothing. They, no, no. Who, whoever support, like whoever uses this as an excuse to say, oh, look what Iran done now. Really, like these, they have uh, zero political awareness. Um, they have uh, zero analytical skills. Um, and this is very, very similar to what Iran done against the American base after the killing of Qasem Soleimani in order to save face in front of their supporters, in front of their militias, in front of their proxies, and say, look, you know, we've, uh, this is, uh, we've, we've done something at least. And Iran's diplomatic mission to the UN came out and said this matter is concluded. Yeah, after we've done, yes, yeah, we said this is done. Um, we had to give a uh, proportionate response. Yeah. This went against our diplomatic premises, uh, that was done against our diplomatic premises in Damascus. This matter can be concluded. However, should the Israeli regime make another mistake, Iran's response will be, Considerably more severe, it is a conflict between Iran and the rogue Israeli regime from which the US must stay away. Mm. But what's interesting here is their concern about a Zionist response because that's what could potentially still escalate things. Yeah, this is where this is where things can become can go out of hand. Because Iran's still playing within the rule books, I think. Yeah, they're playing within everyone's playing within the rule books except for Netanyahu. Yeah. <laughs> Netanyahu is the rebel that's playing not Netanyahu and some some of the resi the resistance groups in Gaza, mashallah alayhum. Like who, the, those who are resisting occupation, Netanyahu is the only one that's playing outside of the rule book of the Americans at the moment, um, and he's just lighting fires everywhere. He wants to light the whole region on fire. He wants to drag everyone into a war to, in order to serve his interests and the Zionist project in, interest in order to prolong his um, existence in the political sphere in the Zionist entity. Because the moment the war ends is the moment his political career ends. And he understands that, his opponents understand that, his, his uh, competition understands that. So everyone understands this. And he does not want to succumb to American pressures to end the war. America's interest in the war settle now. Iran's interest is for things to settle now. They've performed their attack. They look big in front of the world or in front of their supporters yeah. and they say, look, we've done our part. Let this end now. Yeah. Netanyahu's interest and the, and the Zionists, they're a wild card and they may look to escalate again, to respond again, to respond even bigger, perhaps hit Iran, yeah. in which case Iran might be looking for another opportunity to attack again. And that's where things could escalate. Iran and America, want that, yeah. yeah, they don't want that. But if they hit again, they'll be forced to play some sort of retaliation or to do something to seem like they've somehow responded or somehow controlled the situation or that they haven't been made out to look weaker. So that's where the wild card is. Mm -hmm. That's where things could escalate beyond control, where essentially the, the game could go outside of the rules that have been set by America yeah. and the West. And Allahu alam where this ends up, but I think one of the important things for us to note, as we've said, is that Iran's interest in this is not to liberate Al-Quds. This is a conflict between Iran and Israel, seen as a conflict between two separate nations. Mm. Iran does not do this with the view that we are liberating Gaza. They'll use that for their support, they'll use that for their uh, public opinion, whatever else, but they're intervening for the sake, intervening for the sake of their interests. Yeah. That's right. And so that's what we need to keep in mind as we watch anything playing out from now. I think there's enough evidence to demonstrate that throughout the history of Iran and its involvement in the Middle East and obviously more particularly recent history. Yes, definitely. And uh, inshallah, we've uh, had a long podcast, <laughs> two hours and 13 minutes or so. Um, uh, Zakhla Khair for staying with us and uh, following through till the end if you're still with us till the end. Um, the next podcast we were aiming to do about the two-state solution and the various uh, resistance groups, the PLO, the Fatah movement, um, how they were propped up, how they came about, how they fought against the Zionist entity, and then how they went through the peaceful solutions, etc. There's a lot of history there um, that we need to be aware of um, in order to not fall in the same holes again and the same mistakes again as an ummah. Um, and uh, that's our plan. But depending on events, you know, we don't know where things are going to go. Um, we try to cover the most relevant events before we go on to you know other topics. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, stay tuned with us um, possibly in the next two weeks or so. 
And Jazak Allah Khair. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect the people of Palestine, Amen. the people of Gaza, and the oppressed, and uh, wherever they may be. Um, and may he strike tyrants with the tyrants, and may he free our lands from liberation, and allow us all to contribute towards the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, make sure you stay tuned, not just with the Aqsa Frontline podcast, but with our other platforms, Sound of Palestine, we have our Telegram channels, our WhatsApp channels, we provide regular updates, as well as political analysis. Um, so stay in touch and keep tuned for our next episode. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanak alhamdulik tashidu wa na ilahi ilant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.